Well, good morning, folks. Good morning. Trying to get the maximum bandwidth used today. So I want to kind of like review in short order, not I won't be able to spend too much time here. I know usually I say that we go for a marathon, but I don't have the benefit of having all that time today. I've seen a lot of comments and older videos. Newer subscribers are coming to the YouTube channel and they're commenting and they're finding their way here and they want to know what's going on with the 2023 mentorship. What direction are we going? Um, how to best utilize their time and focus. Uh, number one, obviously, being here on Twitter, this is like my way of connection to you real time. So if I'm going to be doing anything live like this, uh, you'll know about it. If I'm going to be doing a live session or a change in the schedule of the live session, you would know it by here, too. Um, I'm a little chatty still because we haven't started officially the mentorship, which is February 7th. Once that happens, this Twitter will only be notifying you to something about the markets. Um, I, won't, I won't be using it to chat. I won't have time for it, really. Um, so I just want you to know that if you want to keep the notifications off until February 7th, that'll probably save you some sanity because your phone will probably be just ching, 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 ching every time I make a tweet, which isn't really all that essential. And nothing I've put out you know, thus far is really time sensitive. But February 7th, going forward, anything that I post is going to be pertinent to a market condition, something that I have prompted you in a live session or commentary on my YouTube channel because they will be a daily thing. So, and, and it'll incorporate Forex. Uh, one of the questions I got, will I be covering crypto? I'm not a crypto trader. I don't really have an interest in crypto. So, not to hurt anyone's feelings or, or you know, try to upset anyone. I, I never promised that. So, uh, my main focus is going to be on index futures. That specifically is E-mini S&P and or the mini NASDAQ futures contract. The commentary daily on my YouTube channel will include the dollar index, euro dollar, and pound dollar. If, if there's something that I like, if, okay, this is a, this is a big if. If I want to be a deviant, I might mention gold, I might mention crude oil, and or another Forex pair. If there's something that draws my attention to it. So, hopefully that kind of like gives you an idea where we're at. There will be two live sessions tentatively scheduled each week. Why do I say tentatively? Because I may have a schedule change. I may meet my entire weekly expectation in one trading session in front of you where it's this is what I was looking for for the week. It's done. And then I would move to the sidelines. Yes, I can trade and you can trade every single day. Just because we can doesn't mean that that's what I should be trying to teach new students. So I'm kind of bringing that uh, that mindset into the live sessions. Now, live sessions, I, I saw a guy, and please don't be offended by me making mention because you know who you are. <laughs> One of the followers on this Twitter channel mentioned that they are ready. They have a small funded account ready to follow me on my live sessions. And that is what you should not be doing. Okay, because that communicated to me, and I may be me misreading it, but here's what I don't want you to think, and I don't want you to do this, and this is not some kind of code word, follow ICT, do this as a trade signal, okay? If you're going to be in my live sessions, and if you're in there trying to press the button and do trades, you are not going to be learning properly. Because if you put a trade on, and it starts running like I expect it to do, because I'm not going to, unless I specifically talk about a market condition, and we will do these things, there will be times where I'm going to purposely put you in front of the charts where it's going to be hard. Okay. That's going to be a high resistance liquidity run. Now, high resistance liquidity runs, and this is for your notes. Okay. Because if you're listening without a notepad and it's something to write with, you're wasting your time. Turn this off and watch it later on when you can. But high resistance liquidity run is something that could pan out. But it's not likely to do it efficiently, quickly, and it's going to probably bring a lot of consolidation, 
move a little bit in the direction and then retrace a lot more than you want to see it in your trade versus what I try to teach as a dynamic price action trader. You want to see a low resistance liquidity run, something that moves from your entry, never even approaches your, your stop loss and just runs quickly, just like that to your target. That's what separates my teaching approach. That's what sets my models approach from everything else because I'm not trying to be in there because some indicator gave me some inclination that it should or shouldn't do something. That's, I don't believe in indicators. You have four indicators that are the best thing you're ever going to have. That's the open, the high, the low, and the close of any time interval. So the variable in there is time, but it's also the main constant. That's the deciding factor in every trade that I'm going to take. Every trade that I'm going to take for the rest of my life is going to be hinged on time. So you're going to see what that means every single week. You're going to understand the element of time. You're going to understand the difference between a high resistance liquidity and a low resistance liquidity run. There's a, there's a stark contrast between those two. And obviously, if you've gone through the core content that I've uploaded last year on my YouTube channel, I cover that. But even without having the ability to sit down over a chart live and watch it dynamically deliver price, it's hard to communicate that in a static discussion. Like here's old data, here's old uh, price fractals where it did this and did that. It doesn't effectively communicate it like being able to see it over my shoulder and me comment on it. So I see a lot of live streamers, they'll, they'll do their live stream. And uh, let me just put, toss this out there. Matt, I wasn't trying to, you know, embarrass you. <laughs> if, if you if you look at it that way, um, you know I rep you on my YouTube channel. Yeah, I love you. I think you are going to do well if you keep this tenacity. I thought I was sending something to you that only you and I could see. But I, I mis, misjudged that apparently. Apparently went across my uh, Twitter feed. So, <laughs> oops, sorry. But uh, I see folks like Matt. And uh, there's another guy that I just started following, uh, Patrick Weiland, who, if I'm not mistaken, used to troll me, but uh, I've been watching and he's been doing some live sessions and he's done some prop trading, apparently, and, and he's hooked up with, uh, I think it's Top Step. And he, he's calling it live. He's doing his executions and he's and that to me is commendable. That's, I have a lot of respect for that. Um, he's a bit of a character, and that's cool. I can appreciate that. <laughs> but he and Matt are, they sit out there for hours. And they'll jabber on about whatever they're you know, wanting to talk about. And then they push a button and they monitor their trades. And then at the end of the day, they condense their entire streams and do like a highlight thing. Uh, I don't have the time to do that this year. So that's the number one reason why I'm only doing two of them per week because they're they're going to be about two uh, up to about two hours in length. So I'm not going to sit down and edit out all that stuff. You're going to see it raw, just the way it was if you were there live. I don't want to be in YouTube editing studio, you know, every day of the week for hours at a time. And if you don't know what I mean by that, if you look at the presentation I made just last night for just a two minute video, the Preparation for the first chart. Look at the time in the lower right hand corner when I was showing the example for uh, ES. That's a, a lot of time between putting one chart, annotating it, putting another chart, annotating it, presenting it, condensing it, rendering it, and then uploading it to the medium like Twitter or YouTube. YouTube takes a little bit of time because they like to run their algorithm, see if there's anything that they can ban your account or demonetize or flag you for something so it all takes time so the viewership usually the ones that complain in my following is you know I, I talk too much and i want you to understand why i'm doing things why i'm not doing things why you should be focused on certain things and not so much on others so yes when you're hearing someone teach you and they're trying to do their best which is what i'm trying to do i'm trying to do my best to teach you and you think if you're new if you're here if you're young folks coming here you think that give it to me right now real quick 
dollar menu mentorship. Okay. Drive through mentorship. You know, give it to me real quick. Here's my money. Here's my time exchange. Okay. Not I'm charging now, but it's costing you time. But that time listening to me, I'm not wasting my time because I know I know I have one at least one person that's going to listen to everything I'm saying. And it's going to spare them the pain, the suffering, the trauma that I had to go through. So it's beneficial for you to have the experience from the beginning of the stream to the end. Okay, and that's why I'm going to be just doing two. So if I find an opportunity that I outline for the week and you'll pretty much expect it because we're doing daily commentary as well. So it shouldn't be things that fly out of nowhere. Like, oh, where did you get that from? OK, so. Hopefully it'll, it'll provide a little bit more context as to what it is you should be doing each day and then how much time you're really not doing anything. Which unfortunately feels like the thing that you should be avoiding, you feel like you should be doing something all the time as a trader or a developing student in price action, whether it be with me or someone else you're learning from, the common tendency for a new startup or a new student is that they feel like they got to be doing something every single day, pushing a button, you know, trying to find a stuff every single day when in the beginning and the, the first stream is probably going to set the, the stage for who's going to stay here to learn and who's going to quickly say this ain't for me. And I'm going to try to do my best to be exactly how I plan to be each time. So that way there is no sugarcoating it. There's no enticement to keep coming back. If it isn't exactly what you were hoping to see and learn from on the first stream, use that going forward because that's exactly how it's going to be. But I don't want to condense it and just go to the highlights because if I read a candle wrong, if I say something that doesn't pan out, I need you to see it because that's what you're going to encounter when you do it too. When I'm not sitting next to you on the days of the week or when this eventually stops, because I, I don't want to do it forever, obviously. Right. So once that experience ends and it's only you in the chart, you're sitting in front of the chart, you're going to have these moments where you're expecting something to occur. You're expecting price to deliver a certain way by this time, by this manner to avoid certain areas and not come back to a specific area. You're going to have that. You're going to be expecting it, and then it'll do the very thing that you don't want to see it do. How are you going to engage beyond that? Are you going to lose your mind? Are you going to grow frustrated? Are you going to get angry? Are you going to become scared? Are you going to become anxious? Are you going to feel like this doesn't work anymore? Or is it going to feel like, oh, ICT is mainstream now, and they're changing the algorithm? Listen, we're only going to focus on price delivery. I have dozens, I have dozens of models. All of them work, all of them. My, my own private students don't even know all of the things, okay? There's certain things a trader is gonna hold back for themselves and for their family, okay? I don't need to show you everything, but I need to show you how to read price because once you understand how to read price live, you can go right onto my YouTube channel and go through and pick the model that you wanna use for an entry. If you wanna use optimal trade entry, Easy. You want to use a breaker? Easy. You want to use a mitigation block? Easy. Institutional order flow entry drill. All that is is a partial entry into a fair value gap. That's all it is. It's not even going into the middle point of, a, of the gap, which is consequent encroachment. So in your notes, institutional order flow is just a partial entry into a fair value gap that you expect to see remain open. You will have more insights shared with you over live data because it's not effective for me to teach it to you because it looks like cherry picking. That's what everybody that hates me says. It's just cherry picking. It's not cherry picking when I do it live in front of you. And I'm going to try to convey the logic that I use when I'm reading price. When I'm doing my executions on trading view and you see them enter the stop, the target, my first partial annotate where I think it's going to go. And I try to walk you through as fast as I can in a one minute candlestick. I mean, that one minute candles painting live. So. It's very difficult for anyone with common sense. To argue the point that I'm constantly talking nonstop, nonstop about what the market's doing. I'm typing, I'm annotating. There's no way I can do that somewhere else. I can, I can only focus on, on I obviously I can only focus on one thing at one time. So. When you see this live, 
when you experience it live, you need to constantly remind yourself before we start the stream in February. And the first one is February 7th. Okay. You need to remind yourself that you are not there to try to take a trade. I know some of you are hard luck right now and you, you just want to correct the drawdown. You want to fix yourself. You want to start making money. You, I understand all those things. That's completely normal. That's normal. But you're going to ruin this experience for yourself. You're not going to learn properly if you attach the money to it. This is the reason why you're tape reading with me. You're going to see I'm not going to push the button in front of you. I'm going to outline this is where the market is right now. It should not go down to this level. It should go to this level next. Do you see the difference there? I cannot be faulted if you recklessly go out there and press a button, and it's going to happen. You already know you're that person that's going to do it, and you're that person that's going to be in my comment section saying, I followed that trade, and I got stopped out. You're a jerk. Okay. You own that. That's your responsibility. I'm telling you right now, and I'm going to tell you every single time in every single live stream, do not trade. Don't use this for a, a trade signal service. It's not. Because I need you to understand once you see me outline the candle and I'm explaining why it should and shouldn't do that. I need you to feel what it feels like watching that candle without any monetary attachment. That's the part that every one of my students skip over and they fail because of that. You all want to know how to succeed in using my, my stuff, my concepts? Do everything that my failed students, and I have them, every person out there that teaches anything has a group of people that simply can't do it. And it's because they are not disciplined, period. That's the way it is. Because if you keep doing something over and over and over again, okay, which is like what? Eat a box of donuts every fucking week and you're going to get fat, okay? If you abstain from eating that and you increase your output in terms of your exercise, you're going to lose weight. Doesn't matter if you don't like or like the personality of the person that told you this is the routine you should follow because I'm not here for friends. I don't give a shit if you like me, okay? But I want to see you succeed. I want to see you do well. But if you don't listen to what I'm telling you in its entirety and you only want to cherry pick the terms everybody wants to use against me, you just want to cherry pick the things that I'm teaching and only take the things that you like out of it. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to use this fair value gap. It's easy. Let me go out there and put my funded account or my live account attached to a chart. And it looks like a fair value gap right there. No logic as to why it should be a fair value gap. No logic as to why the market should even be going higher. No narrative, no study. No, no, no back testing, no sitting in front of the chart, reading price action for months, months. This needs to happen. You have no idea what you're doing. And you think going out there, pushing a button because I'm talking over top of it is going to be this magic recipe for you to make money. No, you have no idea the level of anxiety you're going to feel because here's what's going to happen. I'm not aware that you're in your trade. I'm going to be obviously aware that some of you are going to do it foolishly. Not that I'm trying to hurt you. I would never purposely try to put anybody watching my stream in the wrong side of the marketplace. That's not my intent here. But I'm being responsible in the, the most upfront manner I can. If you are trying to learn from me, and if you really want to be independent and independent in your thinking about how you should engage the marketplace, this is the absolute best way to do it, folks. And I swear to God almighty, I wish I could convey it any ha much harder than this. I, I don't know how to articulate it more than that. I want you to do it the right way. And I have paid students that don't want to fucking listen. From 2016, they still didn't do this part yet. They still didn't do this part. And it just takes a couple months to do it. But distractions. Lack of discipline, personal schedules, personal character flaws, uh, stubbornness, all those things are contributing factors. Fear of doing it wrong. For some reason, you all think that, you know, pushing a button with a live account because you think it might do something. And, you know, if you get it right, it'll ease the pain of the scary feeling of, you know, what happens if I get it wrong. So you focus more on if I get it right now, I make money. Wow, that's going to be awesome. If you're trying to learn like that, you're doing it incorrectly. 
because you're making every transaction with these charts a monetary success or failure when you don't know how to trade. So the only thing that's establishing is fear of failure. That's what you're going to, that's exactly what that does. How do you, if you just simply look at the comment section of the videos and, and the Twitter spaces and the Twitter posts that I make, the main psychological barrier that people constantly bring up is how do I, how did I, how does a trader overcome the fear of it not moving the way they want it to do it? And here's, here's how you have to get over this. You have to watch day after day, week after week, month after month, how you read price. When you see me outline the price action, as we come to a PD array, okay, something that would be utilized for a setup, okay, a, an entry model, okay, or a multiplier, the thing that makes your trade uniquely yours, I'm going to read them out to you live as the market's panning out and printing price. I want you to remember that you are not being invited to take a trade on that. I want you to study it. And the one that makes the most sense to you, the one that you can see easily outlined as I'm explaining it, you're going to feel like, oh, I don't understand that mitigation block. I would never use that. But some of you will say, you know what? That's the very damn thing I've been looking for. That makes perfect sense to me. And all of you could be using a different PD array that may exist in that price run, have different results, enter at a different time, and still be profitable. It sounds like it can't be like that, but it's absolutely just like that. And seeing it live, watching me outline every single one minute and five minute candlestick is the only way that's going to happen because you're not doing it yourself. You're watching videos that's something I've already done or, or lecturing about from years ago, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But you're not learning how to read the tape. You have to know what that feels like watching it. And when I do get it wrong, and it's going to happen because I'm looking at the smallest time frames intraday. So there's a lot of fluctuations, a lot of things that can change. And you're going to see that that won't make any difference at all. So you'll see, OK, this is what we're expecting to see pan out. This is the delivery and price we're expecting to see. And then it doesn't do that. I want you to log that experience and feel what it felt like without any money attached to it. Then you can go back objectively after the stream in your own private time sometime during that week. But you definitely want to have it before Sunday, the news. I'm sorry, the new week begins because you want to be able to reflect on what it felt like seeing it. How did that whole bit of business and price action fit inside the entire weekly range? And that's going to start communicating to you where your focus is going to be as a trader using my content. Or if you're just wanting to use what you already make money with, I promise what I'm going to show you is going to help you make better, better money, more consistent setups, and you'll avoid losing more often. I, I wish the folks that would have a opposition to me would just sit down with us, you know, in, maybe in private, okay, maybe you know, don't even talk about anything negative about me. If you feel that way, just in private, prove to yourself that this can or cannot increase your understanding. That's all. Because I promise you, if you submit yourself to this, it's going to open your eyes up to how price really works, how it really books. Why it breathes higher and lower like a living organism. It's, it's not static. It's not stilted. Like if you click on trading view and you look at a market replay, you watch those candles paint on market replay in trading view. It feels wooden. It doesn't feel animated. It feels stunted. It, it, it doesn't feel organic. Whereas when we are watching a one minute candle and a five minute candle painting live, fluctuating up and down inside the same candle. That's something you can't replace with anything else or find the equivalent of it's that's the only way to really do it. 
And you can see the speed at which it snaps and leaves that area and goes to a pool of liquidity or runs to an inefficiency. That, it, ne it needs to be seen live. Whether you record your screen while you're at work or school or sleeping, it matters not. You need to be able to see it as it does it live. So market replay is good to an extent, but that's it. And I mentioned yesterday on Twitter, um, one of my followers sent me an email saying, hey, look, um, TradingView added executions to market replay. And I was like, oh, I wish they wouldn't have done that. <laughs> I wish they wouldn't have done that because I was concerned that everybody that's going to watch my old videos are going to be like, oh, that's what he because they still do it. You know, well, they were doing it then. They say, oh, he's just using, using market replay. Uh, no, no. So even though I'm disappointed in the way that they added executions, I'm glad the way they did it distinguishes live executions. And what I mean by that, I, I put on trades live with live data, executing live feed on the ES and the NASDAQ, okay? That's undeniable. When you watch me toggle the executions, the arrows, and show you the annotations where it shows you where you bought, where you sold, how many contracts and such, it puts the candle and uh, the highlight of the arrow. If you buy it, there's a little arrow underneath it showing you that's the candle and then the annotation tells you the actual price in that candle that my execution was based on and where it was executed on when you look at the market replay on trading view you can do an execution on market replay and the arrow looks a little wonky which is fine i don't like it personally but at least it looks different from that of a live execution okay even if you're using a paper trading account um, if you have your broker attached to that trading platform in trading view your arrow is going to look different from the one that they use for market replay at least it looks different for me it looks a little jagged like it like it's, it's you'll you'll see what i mean if you just look at it but when you're done and you turn off that market replay you can't call those old executions back up when you do a right click on them on the chart and go to executions and show executions annotations or whatever it is or descriptions or i'm not sure what it is but it tells you the actual prices you can't recall them because it's a market replay. So I'm satisfied in that regard because I, when I first saw the email and I was like, oh, no, there's going to be all kinds of people out there faking it now. So if they ever show you executions and such, make sure that you ask them to toggle their executions on and off in their recordings. Because to me, that'll tell you if they did it with a live execution or not, because that's the only way you can do it right now. OK, so I just tossed that in there just for. Uh, community say that way you all can see that what I'm showing you that that's real everything else now can be slightly skewed but also look at the full screen if they're zoomed in and they're trying to hide the fact that that market replay arrow exists in the top of the chart okay that's a red flag there too so and again if someone can do it they're going to gladly show you. you know, there's no reason why they wouldn't show it to you I mean I'm, I show you the executions I show you the arrows I show you the beginning of the trade the end of the trade and that's what you want. If you're going to learn from somebody or just follow someone because they want to share their executions, there's nothing wrong with that. But just make sure what you're learning and who you're learning from and who they're showcasing through specific trade executions, they're valid. They're not something that's, oh, this is a market replay. You knew that candle was going to create that fair value. Gap. You knew. See, I don't have that. I'm at the hard right edge. And you're going to see that. You're going to walk into that jungle on the right edge of the chart on the live sessions with me beginning on February 7th. And it's exciting. Like it's exciting because I want you to see what it feels like to really focus in on what the market's likely to do right now. Where's it going next? You want to learn how to do bias and figure out where the market's going to go? This is how you do it. This is exactly how I taught my students to learn how to do this because it needs to be taken from experience. No book that I can write or anyone else can write is going to teach you effectively how to develop the bias, the narrative, knowing how you, not everybody, you, the person listening to this right now, how are you going to trade? How, how is it that you're gonna go into the marketplace and look for a specific setup? When are you gonna be trading? Are you gonna trade at 8.30? Are you gonna trade at 9.30? Are you gonna try to find a setup before 8.30 because you have to be at work? Are you going to be trading in the London session because you can't be in front of the charts or have access to the charts during the New York session? 
See, all those factors are going to weigh heavily. And no, I'm not doing live streams on London. Okay, I've stopped staying up overnight with London. And I sleep, if I can sleep, during that time. Obviously, you can see sometimes I'll have periods of insomnia. And I may post overnight on Twitter or something to that effect. But I'm not trying to dilute your attention. Everything that I'm going to teach you using the... 8.30 to 10.30, two-hour window. That's the length of our live sessions. We may or may not have anything to do collectively until 9.30. But I want you to see what it feels like to be in there watching those candles, referencing levels that I'm trying to draw your attention to. And then you'll see, oh, this is what he means when he talked about that stuff in those old videos that you have to go through, back test, walk forward, tape reading that's not demo trading that's not paper trading there's a space in your study and your development that has to incorporate what i'm going to force you to do and yes it's going to be boring in the beginning it's going to feel like what am i doing here like anything like anything at all worth doing there's beginning stages that you have to go through this can't be discounted it can't be shunned and expect to get blue ribbon results. If you want to be highly proficient, you want to be highly precise about your entries, your executions, your, your management, your trade management. You want to know where to place a stop loss? You're going to learn that by doing this with me. You're going to understand why the market is not likely to go to a specific level. So therefore, you can trust placing your stop there because it makes most sense monetarily based on the percentage of risk that you're willing to assume. And technically, it shouldn't go there. And if it does go there, you want to be the fuck out of there because it's going to turn on you and go much harder than you would want to be in. Any kind of retracement or reversal, you don't want to be subjecting yourself to that risk. Stop placement. That's why 90% of live streamers don't put a stop loss because they don't know where to put a stop loss because they're afraid to lose. That communicates, okay, that communicates to me they have no idea what they're doing. And I want you to learn how to do this. And I know some of you are listening to this right now. And you may not like me. That's fine. I'm not here for friends, I said. But I'm going to show you how you can put a stop loss in. And you don't have to worry about putting it an ultra small stop loss. Okay? Th that's not important. Knowing where the market is right now. Right now. Where is it not likely to go? That's the first mindset that you should have. Once you've arrived at where the draw on liquidity is, where's it, where it going to reach for? That's the number one deciding factor of a profitable trader. Because if you don't know where it's going, it matters not where your stop loss is. Because if you're upside down in your trade idea and you're going against the grain, you're offside, going against the direction that the market really going to go in. See, that's what you're afraid of right now as a new student. You don't know what you're doing. Just tell me the bias ICT and I'll do the rest. No, you'll lose money. You'll lose money. Because you'll go in. You won't hold the trade properly. You won't use a stop loss, but you'll see a little tiny little fluctuation and you'll think it's reversing on you and you'll collapse the trade. And then it'll run in the direction that I said it would go. And then you're going to chase it. Move too much. And same thing. Oh, no, it's going back down into a natural, small little retracement, institutional order flow, maybe a fair value gap. And that feeling of when price is retracing into something like that, when you hear me talk about, okay, this is what it should do, and you want to let this happen, it's completely normal. It's a boring conversation we're going to be having over the chart. And that's exactly how it should be. It should not be animated with disco lights flashing around, laser trons, and you know, all kinds of pulsing music and shit like that. Okay, you're trying to learn how to reprice. You don't want to have any. Now, once you know what you're doing, once you know exactly what you're doing, you know your model, then yeah, drum and bass, dubstep, hard rock, rap, whatever the fuck gets you going, which gets your juices you know, like flowing and you're in the zone, knew what you're doing as a trader, then yeah, yeah, absolutely. It won't be a distraction then. But I'm not going to have music playing in the background. Okay, I'm not having anything. I'm going to be talking over the chart. And if you're bored by that, get the fuck out of here, okay? Because you're not going to learn how to make money. You will not learn how to do this properly. 
But if you want to learn how to make money, you want to go in like I'm showing you my executions are laser pinpoint accurate. Bam, I'm on that low candle. Bam, I'm getting out in the partials on the high fucking candle. Over and over and over and over and over again. Smacking these other motherfuckers out there pretending they know how to do something silly. You're going to have that same skill set. But you got to walk with me. We even even entered into the jungle yet, and some of you already are doubting. You're looking at shit that is has nothing to do, nothing to do with your development right now. At this at this stage in your development, you're worried about things that are not important. I'm going to walk you through exactly how I took one on one mentorship students back in the 90s. This is exactly what I did with them. But they only got it for one week. I'm giving you this year because you need to see seasonal tendencies. You want to see the, the impact of that quarterly shifts. You want to see who knows what the hell is going to happen. You know, all this stuff that happens across the seas and in other parts of the world, that can have reverberations in the marketplace that you may think, oh, that's in another country. It has nothing to do with me. Bullshit. It's going to be in the marketplace. That means it's going to have to be dealt with if you're a trader here or wherever you are. You can't put blinders on thinking, well, you know, that's stuff over that country. That's their problem. I ain't got to worry about it. I'm making money. No, that can cause you to not have opportunity or your trade to become irrelevant. And it doesn't mean that the model's changed or that the concepts are failing now or to change the algorithm. It just means that's natural market conditions. It's a variable. You have to make allowance for that, which is what risk management is all about. So when you understand where the market's likely to go next, that's your number one priority. Know how to determine where the market is likely to go to next. The highest degree of probability of it going higher or lower and what level specifically. And knowing that if there is enough range between where the market is trading at the time when you determine where the next draw on liquidity is, is it going up? OK, where is it going up to likely? Now, if there is a 20 handle or 20 point movement between market price and where you think it's going to go up to, that gives you a really good opportunity to get your five handles. But why can't I go for 20? You can once you know how to trade. But right now I'm trying to give you a very easy, low hanging fruit objective to strive for, for a consistent opportunity to do each time. And then in the beginning, as we walk through in these live sessions, we're only going to be looking for those five handles. And then once we're done with that, I'm going to say, okay, now we just watch price. That part of the, ex the exercise, that's the part that everybody learns the most from, but it won't feel like you're learning anything. It's going to feel like, but I missed that move. You don't know in the beginning. You don't know what it feels like to be in a correct move consistently. So how are you going to complain? See, that's what I'm trying to tell you. I've dealt with so many of these 20-year-olds, okay, in the last two, three years. They're impatient. They want dollar men mentorship, you know, have it my way mentorship, Burger King mentorship. And they're coming to me with these expectations because they saw Lambo, Larry, and, you know, Ferrari Frank over there on Instagram. They're not executing shit. They're just showing you influence and, and lifestyle. I'm boring. I'm going to show you getting in, getting out, management, stop placement, partials, rolling it up. That's what you need to be focusing on. So put all that shit aside. Stop worrying about what you are going to do later on because you have to get this skill first. You got to take advantage of the time that I'm putting into you this year. I'm giving you my year. I'm giving it to you. I'm giving you my attention. I'm giving you my skill set. I'm giving you my experience. I'm giving you the wisdom. And I give a fuck. I want you to do well. I absolutely want to see you do well. But you have to listen and you have to not do the things I tell you not to do. The things I tell you to focus on for that lecture or that time, that's the only thing you focus on. Here's where you're going to fuck up. You're going to start looking at other charts, at other time frames. Trying to figure out what I'm going to say next. Fucking dumb. That's not how you do it. The very thing I'm going to show you on that one to five minute time frame. But ICT, I can't trade on. It doesn't matter. 
Everything I'm going to show you on that one to five minute chart can be utilized on a four hour and a, and a day chart. And you never need to look at anything intraday. You got to trust me, folks. I'm taking you exactly where you want to go. You just haven't been here before. I've been here many times over. I know how to teach this stuff. I know what it's likely to do next. I'm going to fail sometimes, but you're going to see most of the time I'm going to be right. Period. That's what trading is. You're going to have times when you think you see your setup and you're going to engage. You're going to put your stop loss exactly how it should be. You're going to have your partials already in mind where you're going to take this much off, this much off, and you're going to get determined. It's your final target. And that's your, that's your entire plan, how you're engaging that price move. And it's going to go down and hit your stop loss. A new student, let me say this way. February 7th, it would be absolutely perfect if I go out on my first day and my first thing I'm outlining doesn't pan out. That is the best lesson that can happen. That is the best one because that will absolutely weed out who wants to really learn this. Because if you think for a second that I can go out there and trade and have 100% accuracy and never take a losing trade, th th that's stupid. That's stupid. I only try to engage when the market is so overwhelmingly in my favor. So if you want to call me cherry picker in that regard, then yeah, I'm cherry picking the sweet spots in the marketplace where I'm looking for the highest probability of when the market's going to move to where I'm expecting it to, the time it should do it, when the algorithms will run our macro, and I'll talk about that live over the chart. You'll see it, folks. You'll see it. I'm going to constantly be referring to one market or the other that day. It could be ES or it could be NQ, but most of the time it's going to be ES. I prefer that one more than the NQ. But there's times where I'll refer to NQ and I'll pull it up and say, now look how fast this one's moving versus this. But you don't need to do anything but just trade one. You can just do ES and it's fine. Stop listening to these Yahoo cowboys down there. They're blowing their accounts every day in front of you on live streams telling you they got you got to be in the NQ. No, you got to learn how to be able to do this correctly and not be impulsive because of the quick, sudden movement that NQ will have over ES. ES is still going to fucking move. It's going to move. They're both moving. But you want to be able to find consistent setups. And if you can take five handles out, listen, okay, because I'm going to graduate your understanding, very small little increments, five handles. Per day. That's your goal between February 7th and the end of the year. You want to be able to find that. I didn't say you need to trade with a live account or your funded account and get five handles. That's not what I said there, folks. Listen, your goal is to be able to consistently find five handles that you can see manifest before it delivers in price. You will have that skill by the end of the year. If you listen to me, you will fucking be able to do that. And nobody will be able to take that from you. They won't be able to troll it out of you. They won't be able to cause you to have doubts. They won't be able to fucking cause you any confusion. They're not going to distract you. They're not going to lull you into do some kind of dumb shit over here. You're going to find five handles a day. And five handles a day on a one minute contract is $250 a day. That's not a lot of money. But when you consistently make that every single day, I guarantee you 70% of this listening audience, it's more than you earn a week. And that's just one contract. So what happens if you parlay that up and you get to another $10,000 in profit? Now you can do two, two trade, two contracts. Now you're making $500 a day. And then you make another $10,000. You can afford to do one more contract. So now you're making $750 a day. So you all want to do what you see these fuckers on Instagram and fake shit. Oh, I, I flipped my account this month. No, 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 no. Show me precision entry, impeccable risk management consistently. That right there, that right there makes millionaires. And you can start with any amount, any. But in the beginning, I'm going to take that five handle for the day. I'm going to scrunch it down into two and a half handles 
in the morning session. And I'm going to tell you, here's your homework for the afternoon session. You're going to look for the other two and a half. And then over a period of a couple of weeks doing that, then I said, okay, we're going to look for our full five handles in this session. Then I'm going to give you homework that you have to find that next session in the afternoon. You have to have five handles there. So what does that mean? If you can continuously and consecutively find that setup like that, how many handles are you making a day then? Ten. That's $500 on one contract per day. You don't need to use 16 contracts to make $4,000. I will show you how to make $4,000 in one full pool. One entry to one exit. Fuck these clowns. Okay, these people are literally teaching you to do the most stupid shit and they want you to pay them five thousand dollars for it. No, you don't need that, folks. You don't need that. You're listening to an old fuddy duddy 50 year old man that knows this shit like the back of his hand. And I can't wait. I can't wait for you to see this stuff laying in your hands that you can pick it up anytime you want, like a tool that you've trained with and you know exactly how to do it. How it can hurt you and you don't do those things to hurt yourself. And you'll be able to choose when you want to get in there and do something. Because let me tell you something. Even on a shitty day, you can get two and a half handles. And I'm going to teach you exactly how to do that. And then I'm going to teach you exactly how to get that five handles in the morning and five handles in the afternoon. And I'm going to teach you risk management. So that way, if you want to win trading competitions, you're going to be able to do that too. You're going to be able to scale this as big as you want. Or as small and, and consistent as you want. You want to treat it like a part-time job? I'll teach you how to do that. You want to turn this into a fucking empire? I'll teach you how to do that too. It's going to cost you nothing but showing up each day. That's all you got to do, folks. That's all you got to do. Take notes and just listen. Because I'm going to prove this shit to you on these charts live. And then a fucker out there is going to be able to say anything about it. Not one thing. Not one thing. You are getting ready to embark on an exciting experience. I fucking wish I had this when I was coming up. Like, I wish I had this. And I'm doing everything I can, and I'm planning all the exercises and everything that I'm going to put you through exactly how I wish. Knowing what I know now, looking back at my 20-year-old self, the perfect mentor, the perfect guy to listen to and learn from would be able to do what I'm about to do. I'm not enticing you to trade with live accounts. I'm not enticing you to go with any broker. I'm not enticing you to use any particular funded account. Notice I don't do that. I don't rep brokers. There's somebody out there right now pretending to be me saying that this is the broker that I recommend. I don't rep I don't recommend any of them. They're all fuckers. They're all going to fuck with you some way, shape, or form. Start making a lot of money, and they will fuck with you. Trust me. You're going to get slippage. You're going to get requotes. It's just the way it works, folks. This is the way it is. They're small little nuisances. That's all it is. And that's why you don't want to have all of your money in one account. You want to spread your money across several brokers and one account only, one account. That's the one you parlay up. But everything else, when you make money, you take it out. Don't leave your money sitting out there. You know, anything can happen in a brokerage firm. You know, we can have a big major crash, a flash crash that nobody expects. Not even me. Somebody, something can come out and boom, the market just shifts itself. And brokerages can go under. And you don't get your fucking money, folks. This is gone. So you don't want to have everything, all your eggs in one basket analogy works appropriately here. So I don't represent any broker. I don't represent any funded account. I never tell you to join a brokerage firm. I never tell you this broker's good, go here. I don't ever say use this funded account. I don't ever do that. That's why I don't do commercials for people. I don't do product placement in my videos on YouTube. I get lots of Requests to do that every single month. They email and you say, hey, you know, would you be interested in letting us do a 30 second uh, commercial and we'll pay you $5,000 for it? No. No, thank you. I don't want my channel to be that way. I don't want that. Because that means I'm saying what? I co sign your product, your service, your broker term, your funded account. I don't have that. And I have people that are reaching out that want to start that partnership with me, and I am not going to do it. So there's no incentive for me except for your success. That's it. That's it. That's all I want to see you do. I want to see you do well. 
I want you to send me emails occasionally once in a while and say, hey, look, this is what I was able to do. Thank you so much. I was able to help this person. I'm doing this over here. I'm building a hospital. I put a wing on the hospital over here. I'm putting a, a, a orphanage together here. I've funded this entire village of individuals and I've gave them food for the next 90 days. That's treasure to me. I don't give a shit about online clout. I don't care about that. I want you to be able to feed yourself and your family and help others and be passionate about doing that. And most of you wouldn't even think doing that because you can't hardly make your own bills right now. But once you are able to do this consistently and you can make another stream of income and you decide it, you decide when you're going to do it. And small losses like a flat tire going to work, they're inconvenience, expenses. It's not fun. It's irritating. That's what losing is in trading. That's exactly what it's like because it's measurable. You know exactly where you're going to put the stop loss. You know why if it goes there, you're going to get stopped out. And you want that to happen. If you're wrong, you want that to be the very mechanism that prevents you from lo losing more. How do I get over the fear? You go through it. You just walk forward. That's it. You just keep walking forward. But if you're walking forward with no stop loss, recklessly over trading, adding more contracts when you're already down, trying to dig your way out of it, then you get results like you see some of these YouTubers out there doing. That's not what you want to do, folks. That's not. Have a very easy, low hanging fruit objective, something that's easy, a target that can be easily reached. I think. And somebody that's been trading for a while probably snickered earlier when I said two and a half handles. Okay, two and a half points. Two and a half points is nothing. But high frequency algorithms will fire in there all day long, going up and down in the same day, doing that all day long and make, well, <laughs> a lot of money, a lot of money. But they're losing too. They're getting those. That ebb and flow, up and down, up and down, up and down. They're not all always winning. But they know over the course of the day, ripping into that marketplace over and over and over and firing in there constantly. Catching fluctuations of one and a half, two and a half, three handles. Once it gets there, they're out. They're not in there trying to get the daily range, average daily range. They're not trying to run for buy side liquidity. They're not trying to run for sell side liquidity. They're just in there getting fluctuations over and over and over again. They're capitalizing on that minor fluctuation. Algorithms that are engaging the market. I'm not talking about the algorithm that the market engine uses for price delivery. I'm talking about traders, entities on the outside that are trying to capitalize on price fluctuation. So don't be discouraged by two and a half handles as, oh, that's not, that's not worth my time, bro. <laughs> no, it, you can do a lot. You can do a lot with that because you can take that and scale it. And say, so, okay, I know I don't have a whole lot of time to be doing anything in the marketplace because my schedule won't permit it. Okay, fine. But you can find two and a half handles. You can get that. Not that I'm encouraging it, but on a smoke break at work, a bathroom visit while you're at work, while you're walking through the mall, while you're waiting for your wife to pick out the shoes that she doesn't need like I have to do sometimes. <laughs> Okay, uh, I can't stand being here. She's going to ask me, you know, do you like these? Man, why are you going to put me in a situation where I'm going to lose no matter what? You know what I'm talking about, gentlemen, right? I have to be distracted from that. It'll drive me crazy. So I'll go on the phone and it, there it is. I'm in trading view messing around with something. Two and a half handles is easy. That's literally like fruit hanging on a tree that you just walk up to and grab a hold of it and pluck it off. Whenever the fuck you want. Whenever you want. As long as that market's moving, you don't need to be in those times I've told you to trade in. I'm going to teach you how to trade outside those times. Those times are for students that have never studied price action. They want the highest degree of probability on their side. Then you trade in those times. With experience, you'll know how to engage the marketplace outside those kill zones, those times of... Market action, the nine. Uh, I'm sorry, the eight thirty to ten thirty. That's your sweet spot for the morning session. 
Now, inside that time frame, I'm going to zero in onto specific times where it's highly probable for certain things that occur, and they're called macros. All of that is going over your head right now, but trust me, it's undeniable when I'm looking at it and showing it to you. On a chart, one minute, five minute chart, that's the smallest time interval. I mean, you can go on the second chart, but it gets a little spotty on the second chart because if it's a rip and it takes off, it'll create a gap, which is fine. That's another opportunity in itself, but one minute and five minutes is going to effectively communicate exactly what you should be doing across all time frames. Don't listen to these yahoos from Goldman Sachs that tell you in videos, if anybody tells you that they can trade consistently with interjay's hearts, interjay charts I've done, I couldn't make it work. So they're a con man, run away. Okay. I wish they were sitting in that CPI sp uh, Twitter space I did where I called every single minute candle. Like I knew it from yesterday. That's what it's going to be like, folks. That's what it feels like to know exactly what you're doing, what you're not supposed to do, what shouldn't happen in price. A lot of you, 12,000 of you, at the time I closed that Twitter space on last Thursday, were listening to me, and I was outlining the very candle's movements, why it should do this and why it shouldn't do that. It's going to be a totally different experience when you're watching it in the chart, too. But five handles is what I want you to focus on. That's your goal. In your journal, that's what you're looking for. Okay. Um, I guess it would be, I guess, equivalent to a pip in, in Forex. I'm not saying that we're going to be looking for five pips in Forex. To me, unless you can get 10 in Forex, because you have a spread that you have to beat in Forex. So everything that I'm teaching you with index futures, you have to look at it as a minimum range of can it move 10 pips. 10 pips has to be, if it can't move 10 pips, then I wouldn't even consider doing anything with it because you have the spread, the dealer spread going in and coming out. You don't have that so much in uh, index futures and everybody's price is the same. You don't have that with Forex. Everybody's quoted high on Euro dollar or any, any time frame is going to be slightly different. It's not consistent because you're trading in your broker's liquidity pool. In futures, you're trading in the liquidity. There is no outside sources. It's, this is it, which is why professionals go there. That's why large firms execute in those markets, because they're, they're not going to have the same funny money games that Forex has and crypto has. Okay. Um, let me check my notes real quick here. Uh, So by looking at having a very small window of expectation on what you should be trying to pull out of the marketplace, that being five handles. If we go through this process and you take three months and you can't get five handles, but you can show a record of you doing consistently three to four handles each time you do it, you're not there at five handles. But you're able to go in there, see when it's going to likely move in one direction or the other. And you can time it with a small time frame. Because if you can time it with a small time frame, you can time it with a larger time frame. The larger time frame just takes more time to deliver it. But it's the same thing because price is fractal. It's the same things that are occurring on these small one minute, five minute charts are occurring on weekly and monthly charts. It just takes a whole lot more time. I don't have the patience for that. Some of you might have the patience for that. You may have the predisposition to do, hey, I can do um, a, a trade on a weekly chart. I don't want to go anything lower than a weekly chart. I, I, I don't know how anybody could do that because that's an incredible amount of patience. I don't have that much patience. I can change my mind very quickly. Uh, I can have something distract me and take me out of a train of thought. And it takes me time to get back in sync. So if I'm a trader that requires just daily candles, and I get a news report or something happens and we break out into some kind of conflict in another country or, uh, you know, a scandemic breaks out again, something to that effect. All that stuff's going to take my attention and dilute it from what I'm trying to do in the marketplace. And I won't be able to focus. So because I am obsessively compulsive and I'm bipolar, I'm wrestling a lot of mental baggage. 
okay, that I can't fix. I'm hardwired this way. I can't fix it. So I found where I can engage, where it gives me plenty of opportunity. Even if I lose my focus, someone distracts me, um, my children distract me. I'm late to my charge because of something. You know, I have to eat something or I have to, you know, relieve myself. You know, we're all human beings. Something has you away from the charts and you can't be there. Okay, that's fine. A one in five minute chart puts me right back in sync with things and I can find my own setup. Every single 60 minute candle has an opportunity for you to trade that 2022 model. What? Yeah. During those times I've taught you to focus on, not every hour, during those hours of 8.30 to 9.30 to 10.30, every hour candle, if you strip that down to 15 second candles, that 2022 model exists there. What? Yeah. There's a, what was the, uh, there was a children's movie my, my younger son drove us to a couple years ago. Dr. Seuss, something, the fact that um, like there was this elephant or whatever, at least it looked like an elephant. And they lived in this world or whatever. And he heard somebody talking or these little characters you know, talking in this flower or something. The, the memory is vague, but I remember when they zoomed into this world, it was a whole lot of things going on in, inside there where it's microscopic. Well, if you're looking at an hourly candle, and imagine that you had a microscope and you drilled down into that one hour candle and how much movement took place inside that one hour candle. And you look at it through the lens of a 15 second chart. That 2022 model is there every single hour. The fluctuations are not going to be monumental. But that same thing can be programmed and coded as an algorithm that fires just like that, autonomously. Your perception of price is so heavily taken out of focus with the books, the logic that people teach you, they don't know how the price is really going to book. They have no idea where it's likely to go next. And the, the, the evidence is how they're trading. Like, I watch live streamers just because I want to see when I see their expectation on a marketplace opposed to what I'm expecting price to do. I have a 90% edge that my setup at that moment is going to work at that time. Now, when you hear that, that sounds like you're a jerk. You're arrogant. Listen to what you just said. You're, you're shitting on all these live streamers. No, I'm not. I didn't say one live streamer. I didn't specifically name anybody. There's seven of them that I'm now seven of them that I follow. A couple of them are just very inconsistent. Some of them are consistent, but collectively, when I have all of them, when all of them are looking for something and they start using keywords like there's no way or I think it's really gonna. When they start using descriptors, I'm listening for that. They're on very low volume. When I'm looking to do a trade and when I hear all of them start chattering the same way. Oh, I think it's going to go down when I'm looking for the buy side liquidity. And when I see a fair value gap or institutional overflow entry drill or it runs sell side on a one minute chart or a 15 second chart. And they're saying that very thing at that moment that they're expecting it to go down. Oh, it's going to break here. Watch this trend line break. Watch this descending triangle. It's going to go this way. All the moving averages are pointing down. That's exactly what I want to hear. That's exactly because it's like, that's it. I have that very moment encapsulated in time where smart money is arm wrestling neophyte retail traders logic. That moment, that very, very instant. You're in a 90% bracket right there. Now, some of these live streamers are still making money in that day. But I'm listening for that sentiment reading that I'm, I'm trying to get that from them. I'm not in their live streams shitting on them. I'm not talking about them. I'm not trolling them. I'm not doing it. Most of the time, they're not even aware that I'm here. 
but I'm listening. I want to hear their descriptive tone say they are committed to this going one direction or the other. And I'm waiting for that to occur when I'm looking for my market move. And if I have a PD array right there at the time and I hear that, I don't smile. I don't smirk. I just know that, OK, I, I'm, I have now retail sentiment telling me exactly what I want to see as an opposing view. And because I trade with smart money logic and concepts, that arm wrestling match between someone that reads retail books and is reacting to price versus I'm sitting and waiting. I'm waiting. I'm waiting for something to occur in the market, in price. And I know that retail traders, that's why you see me sometimes comment saying, retail wants to go long here. Retail thinks this. That's the very time I'm hearing, if you see it ever in my live recordings or I'm annotating the chart where I'm in the trade or where I'm about to move a stop or take partials or whatever. I'm listening to that. And that's why I'm prompting it in the chart because I'm getting feedback from live streamers that are telling me that that's what they see. And when they lose and it goes the other direction, the more disgruntled or the faster they feel like, oh no, or oh, they sent, they sent like they're surprised, the better the trade is. So I, I know I'm going to run to my buy side or my next partial rather quickly at that time. And you'll see me say what? I want to see speed and distance. <laughs> Oops. ICT just let the cat out of the bag. That's what I'm doing. I'm listening to retail traders literally tell me the opposing side real time. Real time. And that gives me the juice with my own concepts knowing that, OK, this, this is going to really deliver. Nice. but. In, in all actuality, it's occurring all the time. If you don't believe me, look at some of the posts I've done where I've done my executions, and you'll see students say, um, I got stopped out there. I thought it was going to go the other direction. How did you figure out that that was a long, or why'd you go short there? I was trying to do the opposite. So even in that capacity, you can see that it is a phenomenon there. So I love, I absolutely love the fact that these you know, these souls out there are willing to put themselves out in front of the entire world and push a button and share their intelligence or lack thereof, not to be disrespectful because some of them are streaming before they learned how to trade. But others are out there being profitable, but I love hearing them become very committed to one side of the marketplace. It doesn't mean just because they start saying, hey, look, I'm, uh, it's going to really crash down here or it's going to sink. It's no way it's not going to um, go down. Just because they say that, doesn't mean I'm going in there fading them. That, that's not what I'm saying here. What I'm saying is if I'm already anticipating something and then I hear the retail squawk box that I create with these live streamers, that moment when they do that, that to me is a, that's it. That's the last check on all the boxes that need to be for a really quick low resistance liquidity run because it's exactly when they would not expect it to occur. And I'm capitalizing on them because they're trying to keep their social media equity curve increasing. So they want to constantly give engagement to their viewers and they want to constantly sugarcoat and entertain. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's absolutely commendable. And if they're consistently doing something and they can make money, great. Who cares? I'm only trying to tell you what it is I'm listening to these live streamers for. I'm listening for that moment, that very moment where they're absolutely now committed. If I am expecting something in the opposing direction and I have a PD array I'm, I'm watching, when I hear them say that, that registration of committal on their part, and if it's just one of them, not so much. But when they all start, and it's almost like they're crickets, they start chirping together. Like, you know, it, it's weird. It's a crazy phenomenon, but it's literally like, Fade 101, if you're using the things I'm teaching you in price. Not all the time. Not everything they say can be faded. That's not what I'm saying here. But that's what I'm, That's why I'm, I'm, I'm listening to specific live streamers. So please, if you know that I'm a follower of your live stream, that's not meant to be disre disrespectful to you. Okay. Um, I think what I just said was rather balanced. I didn't make anyone sound or in, 
imply that any of them were failed traders. I didn't say that at all. I'm just saying for my personal study and an observation and a laboratory experiment, when I teach my sons how to do this, I'm telling them that look, listen to what they're saying right now. Do you see that? And you see how what I'm showing you is opposed to that. Just sit back and watch what happens. Now, I ain't going to lie. They're laughing and saying, yeah, how can they not see this? Well, because they, they're not aware that what we're having this discussion about. They're not privy to it. But I'm privy to their expectation and their bias because they're making it public, right? So I'm capitalizing on that. Much like all the meme stock traders that were in Reddit saying they were going to beat the hedge fund managers. <laughs> no, you weren't. And you can see their stocks have been smashed. They didn't do what they said they were going to do. Okay, so they used that sentiment reading in Reddit's chat rooms or whatever it is they use. I don't know if I've never been on Reddit before, but I told you all on Twitter, I said, don't, don't touch these stocks because now they have the bait. Everybody thinks they're going to be able to muscle it up. There's a lot of people that are buying it, but why didn't it go to the moon? Because it doesn't work that way, folks. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. I, I, I know it's frustrating because if you're new and you think, oh, it's going to go up to the moon. No, no, it's not. Especially when everybody thinks it's going to go up there. It's not. Uh, in passing, real quick, I'll, I'll just mention this. Um, I saw a tweet. Some guy sent me a, a SpongeBob meme. Something how you said uh, um, Bitcoin to 10,000. Um, I'm not a crypto trader. But I believe once they roll out all the central bank digital currencies, that all of your crypto is going to go to shit. And I'm OK with being wrong. I don't have a, I don't have a horse in the race. I don't care. I don't care about that. OK, but I wouldn't be buying it and I wouldn't be looking for it to go to 20,000. I wouldn't be looking for it to do anything. It's going to probably be very frustrating. It could stay chopping in here between 22,000 and whatever the low of the. You know, the most recent low was. It could just bang around in there for a long time. It makes no sense to me. I don't like the asset class. And there's better real markets to trade with precision. So I'm not worried or influenced by anybody that is a fanatic with crypto. Anytime this thing goes up a little bit, you all think it's going to Saturn. Okay. Fuck the moon. You're, you're, it's going out of the solar system. And it's just, it's unfortunate because that has hurt more people than I think in any asset class in the last 20 years. Like that, that mindset of it can only do that when that's not true. Markets can stay in a choppy, shitty ass trading range for a long time. And you're the whole time expecting it to go to the moon and, and drive you nuts. Fuck that. If I'm going to be in here in these markets, I'm going in there where I'm going to make money, find my setup, get in there, get it and run. And I'm going to live my life. Not obsessively looking at my phone, worrying about who's going to say something bad about crypto or Bitcoin. Oh no, FUD, or I don't even fuck that. To, I think it's I think it's FUD. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know about it. Okay, I just know that that segment of Twitter and the trading community are just wild. Like they're just really, really wild. And I wish I could get that same fevered pitch into futures. <laughs> could you imagine? It would be so amazing because you would have such a a, a rich sentiment reading. Because crypto sentiment is perpetual bull. I mean, there's a lot of smart folks out there know that, okay, yeah, it's probably not going to go up because it's going to do this and do that. But by far and large, crypto really is like, it's a circus. Like it, and it's carnival. Like it's absolutely insanity. And unfortunately, a lot of new money, a lot of new traders came into trading through that, expecting it to go to them and expecting it to do really well. And I mentioned, you know, you got to be careful. You know, it's going to go to shit. And look how many times we've had, like, the FTX stuff. And you know, my own son, he has his shit caught up in uh, a broker he can't get his money out of, okay, because he didn't listen to good old ICT, his daddy. So it's frustrating. And I know I'm going to be frustrated because some of you are going to do things that you're told not to do. You're going to do things that you were never told to do. And you're probably going to hurt yourself this year. And I want to remind you all, that's your fucking fault. That's your fault. You did that to yourself because there's nobody's ever going to say ICT caused me to lose money because I've always taught in a paper trading account or a demo. And they're in a fucking court anywhere. They're going to say, oh, yeah, this demo trader, 
this demo trade, this concept in a demo trade caused you to lose money. You took the initiative to push a button. And I'm telling you, don't push a fucking button this year. Don't. Don't. Learn how to read price. Learn your own tendencies to be impulsive. That's going to be a painful lesson for you. What's impulsive mean? Gentlemen, you're walking next to your girlfriend or your spouse, significant other. You're walking and all of a sudden, out the corner of your eye, miss everything, miss thing. Dressed to the gills, beautiful, lovely. What's your eye do? Look over. Now, you know at that moment, that moment right there, you better get your shit fixed real quick before your significant other catches you looking. But now what do you do? You make sure the coast is clear, then you look back again. And then now you're undressing her. That's impulsive. That's the thing that you know you should not do. But you fucking did it, didn't you? And you might get away with it once in a while. You might get away with it at that instant. But if you live your life like that, your significant other is going to catch you doing that. And what do you think they're going to say? Now, if you're in a long-term committed relationship, they're going to let you, you know, pfft, nudge you with their elbow. What are you doing? Get, you can't get that. But if you're in a young, new, fledgling relationship, and you haven't really committed yourself either party, and it's something new and fresh, you're going to feel insecure if your significant other is looking at someone else like that and gawking. Because you're going to think, oh, they're looking somewhere else. The grass is greener on the other side. That's impulsive. How's that related to trading? Well, ICT said that he thinks it's going to go up to 4,030. And I'm in front of the charts right now. And he, he's, he had mentioned that fair value gap. So that's pretty much like you know, him saying buy it right now. So you know, even though he hasn't said anything about really technically buying it, and he hasn't really said where the stop loss should be on this particular fair value yet, yet I've got you know pretty good feeling that you know, the grass is greener right now. If I just go in there and just do, you know, just do one contract, just buy one contract. And if it goes up to 430, I won't say nothing. You know, and he'll probably think it's funny. He might like my post if I say, I know I didn't listen, boss, blah, blah, blah. And then I made that 430, you know, high five every week, every, every day and won't stop. No, that's impulsiveness. Okay. You do the things I tell you to do. You don't do the things I tell you not to do. Focus on the things I'm telling you to focus on and nothing else. If you just follow that going through the rest of this year, you will get the understanding that you need to do it independently. You'll know when to do something, when not to do something. You'll understand how to place a stop loss. You'll understand what it feels like to get in there doing it and desensitize yourself. That means remove all that fear and anxiety that you're feeling about doing it incorrectly. You're going to do it incorrectly, but that incorrectly done process doesn't always equate to failure. What causes failure? Repetitively going in, fixing what you think is an error. It's just a transaction that didn't pan out. And it took something away that wasn't a deposit in money, a loss, a loss of time. You, you, you're going to see we're going to be in moves, and this will be a hypothetical. This is where your stop would be. I'm not going to push the button. There won't be a, a hard stop there, but I'll be communicating where I think it should be. And the market will go down to that level. Okay. Well, if it's at a point at which would be break even, you got to think about what that felt like to be in that trade, have unrealized profits. You haven't, you haven't got out of the move, but you're seeing it. It would be four and a half handles, maybe eight handles, maybe 10 handles. And if you didn't take a partial, or if I don't indicate there was a partial to be taken, which isn't going to happen because if five handles, you're taking it. This whole time investment will feel like a waste if you've done nothing but get break even, which is the actual lesson in that. You need to take partials. If I'm teaching you your threshold should be aiming for five handles, doesn't it go without saying if you're watching something, if it goes to five handles, you should do what? Initially, square the position off right there at five handles. And just watch, does it go beyond five handles? And you're going to feel all this impulsive behavior start to well up inside you. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. If you're, tra if you're trading with a live account, following along in the commentaries I'm going to do in live streaming, you're going to feel like, oh, no. 
I shouldn't have listened to ICT, that fucker. He told me to get out of five handles. Look at it, it's like 30 handles. What did you learn there? Greed. And it's going to build in the building blocks of fear of missing out on that next big rip. Instead of just saying, I was looking for five. It gave me five. I moved to the sidelines. And now I'm going off to go spend time with my kids. Go watch a movie. I'm outside. I'm doing whatever I want to do. Take a drive in my car. I'm on vacation. I got this one in and nobody knew about it. It's done. I'm not condoning vacation trading, by the way. <laughs> uh, every time I do it, I, I hate it because it ends up coming hours and hours and hours in front of the charts. And then my wife says, you, know, you weren't supposed to bring that. You said you weren't going to. I know. I'm sorry. That's like that analogy. The wandering eye. These charts. I'm sorry. They're all beautiful. <laughs> and I live a monogamous life. But as a trader, my eye, it just lingers. OK. And in the charts, I'm going to see a hottie. OK. I don't I don't see numbers in, in candles anymore. I just see a brunette, a blonde, a redhead. No, I'm just saying. I'm just being funny right now. My wife is is the only one for me. <laughs> the, the wandering eye scenario will get you hurt in trading. Okay, so I want to make sure that you all go in with the right expectation, the mindset, the focus. And by doing it this way, it's going to be boring in the beginning. But once you see, we can see these things panning out. Every single time, it's the same fucking shit. It becomes entertaining. It's almost like the book you've read multiple times. You know the you know the plot, you know the character engagements, and you know how it's going to end. Now, that same book that you read over and over and over again, you give it to your kid, or your dog gets a hold of it, chews it up, rips a couple pages out, or spills coffee on it, and you can't read a certain paragraph. Do you lose resolution if you go through that book and can't read that one or two paragraphs? You lose a little bit, but you are familiar. You still know what is likely <clears throat> to occur. You've been there before. It's kind of like a hologram, okay? Um, a hologram and how a hologram. Oh, I'm going into a scientific. Well, I'll just go there. A hologram is an image that's formed with a capacity that allows for some things taken from it and you'll still you'll still see it you might lose a little bit of resolution but you can still see it versus only being able to see black and white binary only that's not what this is because you're going to be able to see more than just one setup which makes you much more effective as a trader see if you're following a logic like most retail things are you're looking for this one pattern. You're looking for this one setup and this indicator. When it's oversold, you're trying to buy it. When it's overbought, you're trying to sell short. If the moving averages are pointing down, you're trying to go short. When an overbought reading happens in your indicator, that really confirms that it's probably time to sell. By that logic, once that pans out and say the market starts to drop a little bit and it leaves the overbought condition and you're between overbought and oversold, you're in that area where, hey, you know, you're between setups. That was one of the frustrating things I had when I was using retail stuff and you know, fumbling. Only when the market was going parabolically up, I felt that it was working because I only only used a 50-day moving average on the daily chart for my bias. It was if it was sloping up, I wanted to focus on being long. And then I used an hourly stochastic, slow stochastics. And I looked for type one bullish divergence, which is the classic lower low in price and a higher low in stochastics while it's oversold. Once the uh, K and D crossed on the stochastic, that line, once that occurred, then I would go in the next day and I would buy strength at the open. And that's how I was trading. That was, I mean, that was it. There was nothing to it more than that. Now, I was teaching people like I had figured out, you know, how to, world, how to end world hunger. You know, this is the to fix everything. And some of my students back from the 90s on America Online are actually still in this community here. <laughs> Hi, Ray and uh, Steve Michael Garner. The uh, folks that have watched me evolve as an as a educator and as a mentor uh, know full well the difference between today and how it was when I was just discovering how money can be made. But I can tell you as a 50-year-old looking back, those instances, I really didn't know anything 
Like I didn't know anything. And I translated market success on just a whim. It just happened. Okay, it was coincidence that I happened to be long in a time when the market was going up. And I didn't understand it. It was going up because it was no way for it to do anything but that at the time. Everything was in a commercial bull market. It was just parabolic. Everything was just straight up. So anybody buying anything could have made money then. And that, to me, looking back, was very painful as a young man because I was wanting it so badly to be skilled when it was just happenstance. Whereas now, I can, I can talk to you in wisdom and know that that was not wisdom then. That was pure and absolute luck. Whereas now, today, I have something that's measurable, it's transferable, and other people are doing it. You know, and they're making real money with it, not just market replay or paper trading or demo. They're, they're really realizing profitable results, and they're, they're handling that and spending it and doing whatever they want to do with it as they should. But as a retail trader, if you're focused on whatever it is that they're teaching with retail, once that trade scenario starts, they train you to do what? Well, if you didn't take the trade, let it go and wait for the next trade setup. Well, what if it means that you have to wait for that crossing of the moving averages and they got to be sloping down and then you got to wait for another overbought scenario to go short? That's a whole lot of waste of fucking time for me. Like I, I, I couldn't tolerate that. So one of the things that became a, a transition for me out of retail stuff is that even though if I was thinking that if the market was bearish, whatever market I was trading, and I was using a 50-day moving average to give me my bias, and then on the lower time frames, four hour and one hour, I would use a 10 and 20 moving average, exponential moving average. And, and if they were both pointing down and you know stacking, in other words, they're separating and pointing down both directions. If the daily at a 50-day moving average that was going down too, that to me was a very, very strong bearish bias. Then if I waited for an hourly overbought, that would get me in sync with a move that had already happened on a higher time frame, where other traders that using that logic wouldn't even consider it. So what did I start doing without really knowing what I was doing? I was taking the fractal nature of price and breaking down a larger move into smaller moves that repeat the same way. So some of you are in here listening to me and you don't trade like I do. You have a lot of retail indicators and you have logic that are found in books and you still make money. God bless you. I'm not saying anything about you not being able to make money. I'm just saying the things I'm going to show you about price are going to help you ferret out the winners in your system right now. And you're going to understand why they're winning. And you're going to understand how your system is losing when it does and how you can reduce that effect and minimize it, which is, again, all I'm trying to do is help you. There's no sales pitch. OK, I'm doing this because I love doing it. I, I love teaching. I love sharing this stuff with you. I love seeing you run with it and do well with it. And it motivates me. It keeps me going. It's my entire life. <laughs> OK, but if I can drop down into a a bearish model like that using any other retail logic, it started this whole mindset. Okay. If I am really thinking that this is the only time trades are occurring when this retail trader model is saying it's a sell, what's going on when the indicator that I'm using for overbought and oversold, who's buying and selling? when it's in between overbought and oversold. So I started mining that, going in there and studying price action in those periods. And then I discovered that between overbought and oversold, there was these little micro gaps, fair value gaps. That's where I got the whole term. That's why I gave you the logic and taught you that, okay? In between the best entry and the exit, of the best case scenario, your mindset should be thinking, okay, the market's going to be reaching for something. And then the retail model was it once it gets oversold and diverges bullishly, that was my exit strategy. Once I became a trader that could sell short, 
which took a very long time because it didn't make any sense for me to be able to sell something I don't have. Short selling was weird to me. But my, my counter uh, trade or the way I would kill a trade is if I'm short, I would use a divergence that would be bearish. And then I would look for a price to go lower the next trading day at the opening. I would look for a price below the opening price. And then boom, once it traded down to that price, the weakness of going below the opening price would get me in. And then I would do two times whatever the highest high from the, the entry point, whatever that amount of movement would be. That's where my stop loss would be. That's how I did it when I was trading with uh, the job, when I was going around filling vending machines, driving all around Baltimore, in and out of places all the time, using a quote track machine, little looks like a transistor radio duct tape to my work truck windshield. <laughs> Chart books laying piled up next to me in my lunchbox. I was a crazy ass looking freak. Like, I mean, I'm running around. I got charts rolled up in my back pocket and I'm, I got quote track next to me while I'm filling candy machines up. Okay, I'm putting candy bars. You know, when you go to the hospital, put your dog on there. Or you can't get a candy bar for a dollar now. But back when I was doing it, it was 45 cents a candy bar, 50 cents a candy bar, 50 cents for a can of soda. So I'm filling this vending machine, and I got my coat track laying in the, the empty column that I haven't put Twix in or Hershey bars in or potato chips in. Okay, so I'm watching price, and I'm looking at it. I said, okay, all right, it should be filling me right now. On well, my stop order, I should be I should be short right now on soybeans. So you don't have to be in here watching real-time data. You don't have to be day trading. If you're going to learn how to do this and you know that you can't be an intraday trader and you need to trade on higher time frame trade, uh, trading ideas, I'm going to teach you how to do that this year too. But back to the, the development of fair value gaps. When I was looking at the range between a price run that would be bearish, between the actual entry that would be ideal, I may or may not been able to participate in that move and that was a very great deal of, of stress and anxiety and frustration for me because if i missed something if i didn't have the the prowess to observe it before it formed and then it started breaking down i would feel like i'm gonna miss that move once it starts moving and you probably feel this is the same way when you see me talk about a move or i've highlighted certain things or maybe you just found it on your own and there's nothing wrong with that. that's great the market starts to move you know where it's likely to go. You know what it's reaching for. There's an equal high. There's a single high up there, or it's going to a fair value gap that's above the marketplace. You know, in your heart of hearts, in your gut, you know exactly that son of a bitch is going right up there, but it's already started moving. So what do you do? Plunge in there with a demo. Buy it right there. Or sell it if you think it's going down. But then what happens is, is you're now, in your mind, you're saying, I don't care if it comes down against me because it's a demo. It can't hurt me. But if it goes up there, fuck yeah, I was right. Look at that. Woo, video game trading. What are you teaching yourself? Don't worry about the loss because it can't hurt you because you're in a demo. But feel good about the transaction if it goes up there because you're right. Now stop and think about that for a second, folks. You're doing everything wrong. You're teaching yourself not to respect the risk. That's the paramount issue when you go into trading. You have to have a stop. You have to know why you're putting a stop there and how much are you risking. Some of you are just doing the simple average 50 contracts or 50 lots on your trades on trading gold. You're not trading no 50 contracts of gold. And you're not adding every time it goes up two points. You see the MT4 guys that they got 30 trades of the same market and their only difference in price entry is one or two points. And they're showing you their fifty thousand, their sixty thousand, seventy thousand dollar wins, all stacked up. I have never liked to post like that. You didn't take that trade. <laughs> That's not a real trade. That's just you seeing what will happen if you did that. And you're you're getting drunk on math. And that's dumb. When you're looking at a market move that you think is going to go to a specific price level and it's already started. You wait for a smaller time frame fair value gap. When it trades down into that, then you can engage it. When it starts running, observe it from that point on. But you have to know where the stop loss will be. And that is below the fair value gap. So when I started breaking down the market like that, that's okay. 
Soybeans started taking off. And I, I missed the move. Live cattle. These are all commodity markets, by the way. You're probably thinking, what the hell is he talking about soybeans and live cattle? I was a commodity trader when I first started. So when I started the trade in the bond market, the 30-year treasury bond, and when I was trading the S&P uh, futures contract, I would see these movements after the fact sometimes. And I would feel like I got to rush to get in there. And I missed it. I missed it. So my focus took me into studying how I could engage a move that already started. Because my, my tendency is, tell me something that you can't do, and I'll find you a dozen fucking ways where I can do it better than you could ever imagine. Because I have a chip on my shoulder, and I'm obsessively compulsive. And a grandmother that no longer lives anymore told me something that scarred me. Said I was lazy. When I wasn't lazy, I was fucking tired. And she was expecting me to do something that was beyond my capability as a 11 year old kid. So when I had her tell me I was lazy, honey, you're lazy. I was like, you said what? So that's why you see me work the way I do. My work ethic in everything I fucking do is off the charts. I always over deliver. I always do that. Because nobody's saying I'm fucking lazy. I can tell you, you, you're lazy. I can say that to you. Because if you're not putting in hours each week, if you're not making dozens of pages of notes each week, not five little lines on a page and scribble and say, oh, I did the work. Here's my notes. That's fucking bullshit. That's comic strips. Okay? That's what that is. You're wasting time. People that want to learn how to do this, they're going to pour themselves into this and they're going to get what they're looking for and find more than they were looking for. So I had to go in and figure out how to compensate and, and build and develop a coping skill for this fear of missing out. See, you have no idea what the fuck you're doing, but you want to go in there with a funded account or a live account and try to make something happen. Ignoring the risks, not really understanding the detrimental barriers, obstacles, impossibilities that you're, you're building these walls in front of you by doing it incorrectly. They're going to weigh on you heavily mentally. You're going to see them as they're just too much for me to get through because you're doing it wrong. So I'm not saying I'm smart. OK, a lot of prayer went into this. A lot of prayer. And you can be an atheist. You can believe whatever you want to believe. I'm telling you, this is how I got here. When I looked at moves and I couldn't get myself to accept the fact that I wasn't smart enough in my early days to see that move before it started. And you had a big down day. I knew at that moment it's going to go down to this level here on the daily chart. Or up here above some old high daily chart in deference to the, the bias of almost bullish or bearish. So I wanted to find a way to build a coping mechanism that would make sense for me because nobody in books, none of the books, I got over 2,000 of them, courses, everything. I bought everything you can put your fucking hands on. If it was released in the 90s, in the early 2000s, in 2006, like that was the last time I bought anything. And it was always the same bullshit. And the things that I teach on, none of these jokers talk about. Precision elements, time, where to get in, why your stop loss should be where it's at. Everything you learn in retail is stop below the old swing low if you're long. Stop above the old swing high if you're short. And it's all directly related to the percent of risk that you're willing to take as a trader, which is the universal 2%. Everything about that's wrong. Everything about that shit is wrong. And you're doing it thinking that you're going to be the exception to the rule. And then you can go on social media and say, I climbed a mountain. That's it. I'm putting my flag here at the top of the mountain. No one's ever done it like me. <laughs> when you don't realize what you're learning is misinformation. You have so many factors against you doing that shit. But it doesn't feel that way because you bought the book. You paid for the book. You took the time to read that book. 
You have now joined a religious cult. You think I'm a cult leader. That's a cult. Retail theory is a cult. It keeps doing the wrong shit that you all keep sipping the Kool-Aid thinking you're going to be able to get something out of that. You're getting the same shit, the same bullshit everybody else gets. Losses, drawdown, blown accounts. And misery and regret because you are falling in love with a market and, and a potential experience to change the course of your life. But you can't make it work with the shit that you're trying to spend money on. The smart ones say, fuck this early and say, I can't do this. And they don't ever invest any more money in the retail stuff. And they just say that nobody's making money. And it's not true, but largely it's true. So I had to go in between the overbought and oversold conditions with my retail bullshit that I was trying to use. And I come up with ways how I could go in and engage. And then once I was made privy to how markets are really booked, and met with real market makers, not Goldman Sachs people, okay? <laughs> None of that shit. Not uh, trade desk managers that are controlling the flow for their customer base. That's not a market maker. You're a dealer, okay? That's all you are. You are not making the price. You can engage and transact in that price feed at that very moment, but you are not fucking making the market. When you discover how all this shit is rigged and it's designed to do these certain things at certain times of the day to deliver a certain high or low, it changes everything. It changes everything. You quickly put aside the very shit that they're poisoning everybody else with. All the misinformation, all the bullshit. And you focus on the stuff that matters most. Where's the truth in all this stuff? If it's overbought, oversold, then that's what causes the market to go up and down. If it's supply and demand, then that causes the market to go up and down. Then why the hell is it that that shit isn't making millionaires every single time someone sits down with it? Why aren't they all finding success? Why aren't they finding precision? Or not. Because it has a resemblance. It resembles something that they saw work in a book. And when I bought all these books and I bought all these courses and I subscribed and bowed my head down to all these gurus. I was a young man too. And I believe there's people out there that should have been worshipped. That should have been lifted up and held above everyone else. Heroes. Titans. There is none. I'm not one of them. And your friend and family member on fucking social media that you think is growing to be into be some hero level shit. They're all people just like you and I. And the more they show the shit in hindsight and they can't teach it and prove that it can be transferable knowledge with precision based elements with time. Then it's all just retail. And. Retail is just a catalyst. A good money manager can make money with retail. A good money manager can make money with a heads or tails flip of a coin. I didn't want to be like that. I wanted to be someone that knew exactly what the hell they were doing, why they're doing it. And if I am wrong, I'm okay with being wrong if I understand why I was wrong. But when I was using retail shit, it never made sense why my trades when it would fail. I got stopped out. Why the fuck did this happen? The stochastics was coming down. The moving averages on all the time frames were going down. I had a fucking bear flag. Everything was going lower. And the people on CNBC, it was FNN back then, Financial News Network. <laughs> Shit's different now. The, um, they were talking about, oh, yeah, the market's going to go, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a, a bumper crop of soybeans, which means... There's a lot more supply, so therefore the price shouldn't go uh, higher. So I'm going short. I got everything in my favor, right? I got the fundamentals. There's a bumper crop. So that means a whole lot of soybeans are hitting the market. There's no reason for it to go up. And here I am. I'm going short. I'm in there. It's already diverged variously. It's moving down. All the moving averages are sloping down. Everything looks fucking great. I'm looking to make 50 cents on this move. 
And what the fuck happens? It goes up 18 fucking cents in the same day. Now, how do you rationale a, a, a response to that? That makes sense. That's palatable. You don't. You put your fucking fist through a fucking monitor like I did. <laughs> Pick the fucking broken mechanism that was still resembling a monitor and throw it across the fucking room. That's how I coped with it. That's exactly how I coped with it. And I went through a lot of monitors. <laughs> a lot of monitors like that. I wasn't prepared to have multiple monitors back then. I have a lot of monitors now, but if I didn't know how to trade, it would be very, very costly for me to have that coping skill today. <laughs> so I had to go in and figure out why I'm doing what I'm doing. And if I'm wrong, I'm okay with being wrong because I understand I'm wrong. The market's right. I'm wrong. The market's right. So I have to do what? I have to align myself with the market. Not align myself with the guru's logic. I got to align myself with an indicator. Fuck, I do. I don't need to do that. I need to align myself with the open, high, low, and close. That's what I'm aligning with. That's why my charts are naked. That's why I'm showing you only annotations to take your attention to a very specific element about a candle, a level, not a fucking zone. Okay. When I'm talking about a fair value gap, what levels am I talking about? The highest point of the fair value gap, the exact middle of the fair value gap, and the low of the fair value gap. That's three finite levels. It's not a zone. I'm not going out there and pulling one out of my ass and saying, well, you know, we're going to do a supply zone here or a demand zone here. And we're, where are you going to buy in that? Where are you going to sell in that? That's why it's a fallacy. It's all bullshit. It leaves enough subjectivity so that way they can always go back and say, look at this zone. Look how it reacted in the zone. Fuck that. I'm telling you a very specific level. Fuck everything else. Everything else is bullshit. I'm telling you exactly when these gaps should not fill. So that means what level should you be focusing on? The high end of it or the low end of it. Not the middle. Not the opposing end of it. See a difference there? That took decades to get that. That took decades to know with confidence that I'm going to be able to take this trade, enter here, my stop loss should be right here, laser precise. A lot of prayer. And that still quiet voice taught me that. When nobody, not like what you're hearing here, a foul mouth, manic. <laughs> I had nobody sitting next to me encouraging me along. And I had to become a fiend and dismiss everything and everyone around me. Relationships, friends, hobbies, all of that, I cast it aside. And all of my waking consciousness was poured into this. While driving a truck with my left foot laying up on the steering wheel, steering, while I'm eating a cup of fucking noodles, I'm looking at a chart book going across the key bridge. Is that safe? Nope. But I was dialed the fuck in. High winds could have pushed me into the, the Jersey wall part of the, um, the bridge and it caused all kinds of accidents. That's how recklessly I was pouring myself into this. All day long. All day long, sleeping sometimes three hours, maybe, and getting up and doing the same thing. On Saturday, driving down to Fayette Street to a nursing home to fill their vending machines from my car, my Eagle Talon TSI all wheel drive white car. I've always preferred white. <laughs> Go down there, service that. The whole time, the markets aren't trading, but I got chart books laying in front of me in the machines as I'm putting candy bars in there. I'm pouring myself into it. Maniac. That was how it was. And you have to have that same tenacity. You have to know that you're going to do this no matter what. Who Anybody that is around you that's telling you negative shit that you can't do this, you shouldn't do this, you're wasting your time, fuck them. Fuck them. Fuck them. Because I'm going to tell you, every one of my fucking friends when I first started doing this shit, they said, you're crazy. You're going to lose your ass. I lost my first account and second account and third account. I did. 
but you're listening to me now, aren't you? You're seeing all these other people that do what I'm teaching, and they're making money. You're seeing your charts paint just like how I taught you it would. My friends and family said I was going to fail. They said this was never going to work. I would never figure this out. It would always be a gamble. It would never be a way for you to be able to time the markets. You can't do it. I'm taking you live into one-minute candles, and I'm telling you exactly what the fuck it's doing before it happens perfectly. I was not going to fail. I was not going to be talked out of this. I was not going to be influenced negatively to the point where I would admit failure and go and run off into my life and do whatever the fuck I was going to be doing. Fuck that. I have lived this. November 5th, 1992, 9 p.m. on a Thursday night in Chase, Maryland. That's where I was. When Inner Circle Trader was born, that's the birthday. I came into this world on August 8th, 1972. 7.11 p.m. That was my actual birthday. But Inner Circle Trader was born November 5th, 1992 at 9 p.m. on a Thursday evening. In the family room of my aunt and uncle's house that I was paying room and board $50 a week. That day, I remember it. I was so excited. I was so excited. I'm going to make $1,000 a month and I'm going to retire at 40. That was how I started this whole journey. That was my plan. And it morphed and evolved and became a obsession. And I said many times, maybe this isn't for me when I was losing my accounts, not knowing how to trade initially as a 20 year old. I just was trying too hard to do too fast. Over trading, not understanding risk management, trusting the patterns more than understanding the character flaws that I was bringing to it, which is I demand precision. I demand immediate response in price. I wanted to do what I wanted to do, and I wanted to do it faster than I wanted to expect it before I put the trade on. They're all unrealistic expectations, especially for someone that had no experience. So over years of losing, blowing my account, working really hard, doing part-time job, only on the one single day of the week, which was Sunday, I was delivering pizza on Sundays because my vending job wasn't paying me enough. I made $183 after taxes in my check, and my boss paid me under the table $50 a month. Now think about that. $183 a week and 50 ones. And they're trying to sell a book for $30. That $30 book was a lot of money to me. So on Sunday, I go down to the Middle River with my Domino's uniform on, grab my sign, put it on top of my car, and go out there and do magic tricks for kids at the door when I got their pizza handed off to them. I had my little magic trick real quick with the kid was there, boom, and that would give me a tip. And sometimes I would make $5 a house. And that is how I funded all of my blown accounts. Because I made the mistake of doing a Nations Bank. The Nations Bank doesn't exist anymore. But I took $2,600 off a Nations Bank credit card. That was my first soiree in real trading. And I worked really hard to pay that off and did it again. Funded another account with the $2,600. So it wasn't easy for me. We didn't have funded accounts back then. And frankly, that wasn't enough money to trade with. Looking back now, it was like, no wonder it was so easy for me to fail then. I wasn't properly funded. I had too little money, no, no experience. Off the charts, uh, expectations, unrealistic expectations. <clears throat> Yeah, I know some of you are thinking, this is supposed to be a short one. Well, you know what happens when I say it. <laughs> you love it. Don't fucking act like you don't.
I had to pour into these areas that were weaknesses for me because they would be periods of where it would invite impulsiveness. When a move starts happening, then I can see right away what it's going to do. My mind would feel like I got to go out there and just do something. I got to chase it right now. And the times I did it, it would hurt me. So I would study and study and study. And I would see these reoccurring things where these three candles all the time kept popping up. There was always this thing in between the middle of the moves, the real move, the highest high and the lowest low of a price run. If you start looking at your old data, and anytime a price run does that, find the, you know, the 70% and the 30% range. In that range, you're going to see one or two fair value gaps. If you trade with um, what I'm telling you how to trade with when you see them, that's not chasing a move. That's not chasing price. You're engaging in something that's going to deliver on a larger scale, on a higher time frame price run. And then when I slowly transitioned out of trying to pick the high for going short and pick the low for going long, it was very liberating for me because I demanded precision and I hadn't grown into that yet. I grew into that over years of doing it. But I found the confidence and the ability to stay with it by trading the stuff in the middle of the moves that meets on the bone. Now I can strip a bone end to end and get every little piece out of it because I'm nuts with this. But you can't look at what I'm doing now and think that's realistic because that's the same shit I fell victim to when I first started. Reading books from people that didn't do anything, couldn't do it live if they were in front of you. They're showing you everything perfect in the, in the static charts after it happened. I'm not doing that with you. I'm doing it right when it's happening. I'm calling it before it happens. I'm showing you, look here, and it goes there. If I'm pointing above, your mind should be, okay, we're here at market price. He's pointing up there. So my mind should be, how does price deliver from where it is right now when he put that tweet out to where it goes to that level? What, what formulation of up, down, up, down type movement in price candles materializes? By studying that, even in old data, that's back testing. Okay. You'll see these reoccurring signatures. Signatures are things that repeat in price delivery that are not coincidence. They're designed. It's because it's being controlled. This whole idea of being in at the highest high and the lowest low when you're trying to sell short and buy long, you need to put that aside for right now. That model that I taught in 2022, notice it didn't teach you to get the actual high when you're going short. What did I take away from you? The necessity of being right. How do you know when an equal high is going to be broken out and it's going to continue or if it's going to go above a relative equal high and then a shift in market structure and then goes lower? That's what that model teaches you. It teaches you don't fucking worry about it. You're expecting the market to do what? Expand one direction or the other based on a weekly chart. What's the weekly chart likely to be reaching for? What does that mean? The same logic we're talking about in any time frame. Is it drawing up to an old high or equal highs? Or is it going up into a fair value gap that it hasn't reached up into? Or is it more likely to go down below old low or relative equal lows on the weekly chart? Or down below into a inefficiency, which is a fair value gap on a weekly chart. So you have to figure out, is it more likely for that weekly chart to expand, not to close up or down? Is it more likely to have a movement expansion on that weekly candle up or is it more likely to go down? That right there sets the stage for the 80% bracket for you to be right for your trades. And if you just operate like that, Engage in your trades just like that. You won't have max loss days. Teaching to you, my, heater, my haters now. Okay, that's where you're. That's where you're blowing your shit. When you're doing your live streams and you're blown out, you're going against that. And if you just would put your ego aside and just listen to me, you don't have to rep me. Just listen. 
fix it. Leave a better legacy for your kids. Once you identify that weekly bias on the weekly chart, is it more likely to have a big move up or a big move down? And it can only happen as small as one session. Like it, the big move for the week can happen just in the morning session of one day. And that creates that movement or expansion in the weekly chart. And it's done. You've fulfilled your, your bias for that week. But when folks hear me talk about this, they think when I'm talking about the weekly chart, I'm trying to predict the closing price of the weekly candle. That's not what I'm doing. I'm just looking for factors that would lend well to determining whether or not that weekly candle that we're forming right now or about to start later tonight for a new week, is it likely to expand up or is it likely to expand down? That right there is your 80% threshold that will give you the biggest edge in deciding on how you're going to trade going into the new week. But what if I'm wrong? Okay. But what if you're right and you follow the logic? It will reward you for being diligent about following the rules. If you're wrong, it won't matter because that doesn't mean it fails. It just means that transaction, your opinion about what you thought you were going to see in the market, didn't pan out that instant, that time, that interval, that transaction, just like a flat tire going to work. Just like a cake you left in the oven just a little too long. Just like when you're in a drive through you're waiting 15 cars deep. You get up there, pay your shit, up the road you go. Oh, shit. They didn't give me my French fries. I'm already half home. Fuck it. Inconvenience. You lost something. You going to go back and eat there again? Sure as fucking right you are. You absolutely are. But you're not going to do what? You're not going to turn that fucking car around, waste the gas and time, go right back through there just to get your fucking French fry. You're not doing that. So what do you do? You eat it. That's just an inconvenience. That's the life. That's life. And this generation doesn't get taught to accept those types of things. And you're all coming into this with this millennial mindset and you're all going nuts because you can't have it your fucking way here. You got to align yourself up with this. This market runs the show. And you have to align yourself with this expectation that's realistic. And it has to be uniquely yours. It can't be just because I say so, not because I'm interested in that marker or that specific setup. I have lots of setups. And I might not be watching a chart at the time that you say, oh, well, why didn't ICT look at this fair value gap? Or why didn't he consider this down close candle as an overblock? I'm not looking at that setup like you're looking at it. Don't be discouraged by that because that might be the very model that is yours. And it just didn't give you a setup. Then, what does that mean? It didn't give you a fucking setup. Then, can't lose money on that one, right? But it moved. So fucking what? Bitcoin went up too. I ain't in it. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> I don't care. I know I'm going to catch moves this week in ES. I know I'm going to. Can you guarantee that you're going to make moves in Bitcoin? Crickets. So you're all hoping it's a moon run. I don't need a moon run. You don't need a moon run. You need consistently delivered setups every week, not a hope and a prayer. So between the moves, the highest entry point and the lowest entry point, using retail logic, my mindset went to the middle of the move. That's the meat. That's the biggest portion. The longest duration of price movement is in the middle between the highest high and the lowest low in any price run. Any time frame, study it. And when you see that fair value gap in there, study it. How many times does it close that gap entirely and fill it in? How many times does it just go halfway? How many times does it just go in at this a little bit for institutional order flow entry drill and then continue on? And how many, here's the, here's the main thing. How many times does it go beyond the fair value gap that would stop you out if you were in line with that move? See, I've taught you how to focus on where the market's likely to go. If you got consistent with that, the next stage of your development is where should you place a stop that is reasonable in terms of risk and range? 
that is a repeating process that doesn't deviate much. In short, where do you place your stop that allows you to put a low risk stop loss on, but you won't fear it being stopped out. But if it does get you stopped out, you don't care because you're probably dead wrong about the whole idea and you would want to be out there anyway. Notice that is starkly different from that of a retail book that'll say, if you're going long, just go back to the old swing low and put your stop loss down here. You know, I have so many books that talk that bullshit. If you do that, like if you're trading high grade copper, okay, high grade copper, every every cent move and it's two hundred fifty dollars per per cent move. That's like equivalent to having five minis on on the S and P. That's what it's equivalent to. So, if I'm looking at the chart and the example they're saying, you have to do this. I got to have a two thousand dollar stop. Per contract, go fuck yourself, man. I, I'm not taking that trade. But now I could look at that same setup, break that bitch down, go into a lower time frame, wait for a market structure shift using 2020 model, wait for it to come back down to a fair value gap, trade that, put the stop loss below the fair value gap, and I'll use probably less than half of one cent move as a stop loss. See the difference there? Wisdom. Understanding. But none of the fucking books ever taught this. But it created and presented problems for me that I struggled with because I'm obsessively compulsive. So anytime an author admitted a weakness, they were treasures for me. Because I, well, not so much treasures, but they were treasure hunts. Because if you're telling me you can't do something, tell me you can't do something. I have respect for the fact that you're being honest about that. But I also used it as a pursuit to overcome you. You're right now, you're my teacher because I bought your fucking book, I bought your course, but I'm going to lap you. I'm going to take whatever you have that works and I'm going to turn it up tenfold and I'm going to make it superhuman. Because if it works, I know how to multiply that. And I'm not talking about over leveraging multiple count uh, uh, contract sizes or, or lots if we're talking about Forex. I'm talking about conceptually refining it down to a science. When I was going through school, my whole idea was to become a computer science major and be an information systems manager, where I wanted to be a systems analyst. I wanted the programmers to work for me. I would tell them what I wanted them to do. Code it this way. I want this as the outcome. We learned COBOL. Okay. Uh, it's not is active anymore. We had CICS. When I was learning computer programming, we were using mainframe. Okay, the big reel to reel shit. <laughs> yeah. And C plus was just becoming a thing. Just becoming a thing. So today we have all kinds of languages that I couldn't even sit down to even begin to know. Like I just don't know. And I haven't done it for so long. And anything for coding, like when I have like easy language stuff for like trade station. I have a friend, Logan, he does all that coding for me. He's done it for years for me. And I tell him, this is what I want this to do. This is what I want this to do. I want this to do this. I don't want it to do this when this does this. And there it was. Long-term friend that I've met, and he does all that work for me. But when I sat down and looked at the things that other people say they have a struggling point with, for instance, take Jack Swagger's books, Market Wizards. In my opinion, Market Wizards 1 and 2, they're the only ones that matter. The other shit, eh, whatever. And if you're listening, you're one of the people in that book, you know, it's not, the disrespect, it's not to be disrespectful, but, you know, I just didn't enjoy any other volume in that series. The first and second one's great. What I liked most about those interviews is they talked about their barriers. They talked about what mattered to them. What was the things that were on their mind at the time when they were doing their trades or learning how to trade, how they came up? You know, they didn't talk about what Jack was trying to do most of the time. I'm sure he probably cut most of the shit that they talked about in their interviews out. Otherwise, the books would be very, very long, right? But the things of uh, importance to me would have been hearing how they dealt with certain struggles and what they did with it. 
did they just cast it aside and say, fuck it, I'm going to fail with that every time I touch it? Or do they take in consideration that they could bring something to the table and elevate that struggling point to a strength for themselves and other people? Remember, I'm that guy at 11 years old was told by the grandmother, you're lazy, honey. You're lazy. I'm not fucking lazy. Give me a give me a thing to focus my attention on. And I'm going to find dozens of ways to do it exceedingly well. Because I want it to be easy for me. I want it to be second nature for me. And I'm trying to instill that on my young children. And it took time for me as a 20 year old to figure this out. And my older kids are they still wrestle. They're still wrestling with me. And I'm telling them, trade this way. Don't try to do these other things. Caleb looks at other things in the charts that don't matter right now because he has attention issues. Okay, he looks at other things, and I'm trying to keep his attention right here, this right here. Okay, and I'm trying to include that also when I'm doing my markups and my analysis. When I'm looking at the chart, I'm trying to highlight the actual portion of the fractal I'm only focused in. And I know some of you look at the chart and you think just because I have all those candles on the left hand side of the chart showing that they're pertinent to what it is I'm trading, they're not. There is a segment of price action I'm working within, and it's the dealing range. I'm either looking for that range to be broken to the upside and targeting external range liquidity, or I'm looking for it to trade into a range above or below the existing range it's created. So that's all trading is. That's all it is, folks. And you're trying to make things much more complicated, and you accuse me of complicating things. I'm not. But the problem is, is many of you want to go through a five-minute video. And me explain everything in five minutes. And you can't do that. No one can. No one can. There's so many things I've already covered in this discussion here that you probably never considered. Like, shit, I never, you know, I never really thought about that. Right. And others in here probably listen to saying, this is bullshit. I wasted my time. And you're never going to make any money. I'm promising you're not going to make any money because you're coming in with this same expectation that I had when I was 20. I want it easy. I want it spelled out exactly like this. I want an A, B, C, one, two, three method that I know will work all the time. That's what I wanted as a 20 year old. That's exactly what I wanted. Because the books that I was buying made it seem like that was possible. And when I was blowing my accounts, hey, guess what? Something's wrong with this logic here. I got to figure out what the hell the real story is. And most of it was coming internally manifesting itself in my trading, feeling a, de a de strong desire to prove myself because I was scarred by a family member who I loved. So I manifested that tendency to overcompensate, proving to myself that I'm perfect and I have to be in at the highest high when I'm seeing a bearish divergence on stochastics and I'm bearish on the market. I have to be in there. I have to be in there. If I don't do that, my grandmother is going to say, I'm lazy. That's how it scars you. That type of shit scars you deep when you're, well, wired like I am, which is not normal. And I'm not claiming to be normal. That's why I'm a very difficult mentor to learn from because I have real mental baggage that I can't overcome. I can't. And therapists and all kinds of all the bullshit, it ain't going to fix me. So I turned it into a strength. I sat down. In, a, in an evening on the weekend, literally crying tears over these fucking charts that I could not figure out. I'm looking at these charts thinking to myself, I know I'm going to be able to do this. I know I can figure this out. But why the fuck can't I get this to be consistent? Why can't I find you know, this pattern to trade the bond market over and over and over again? I know it can be done. I see the moves after it happens. Why the fuck can't I see it before it happens? Because I was looking at 30 different ways that other people said in books, and when I was buying their VHS bullshit, okay, I was trying to catch up with whatever I thought was happening right in and there. I was trying to form fit something after it starts moving. So my weakness was what? I needed to have confirmation because I was afraid to step out there and do something and be wrong. Because the consequence of being wrong was detrimental to me because I beat myself up mentally and emotionally because I would refer back to what memory? My grandmother saying, honey, you're lazy. 
And all she was talking about was me being in a, unable at 11 years old to shovel a half a ton of fucking rock and line it around a swimming pool on a day that was almost 100 degrees. And I had already been delivering picnic tables, living with my grandmother, my other grandmother, my mom's side. And I delivered picnic tables with him all morning, picking them up. You know, I'm 11 years old, frail little boy. OK, I mean, I, I wasn't a man. I, mean, I was a little kid and I'm tired. And treated lumber, eight foot long picnic tables, is fucking heavy as shit. You gotta walk over, flip it up on the uh, back of the pickup truck, ride on the back of the pickup truck, unsafe, I know, but it was fun as fuck. Get to the place, and then they want you to walk it around their backyard delivering for five bucks. And I got that money, the five dollar delivery charge he charged, I got that. That was my compensation for helping him. But I had done seven picnic tables that day, and it's hot as shit. And she's like, You wanna come and spend a night? Sure, Grandma, I'm, I'm on my way up there. And she was oh, this. Wait there, I'll pick you up. She picks me up, get up there, a glass of iced tea, a cup of cookies. She's like, okay, well, here's what I want you to do. And I was like, are you kidding me? Like, I can't get this done today. And I was hot. I went back in to get something to drink an hour and a half later or something to that effect. And she's like, that's all you got done? Oh, honey, you're lazy. That was it. I never went up there again. And I was angry. That's the last time I spoke to her. You know, like a grandma type thing. But it scarred me deep, deep. Now, my mom's side, my grandfather knew I wasn't lazy because that man would not let me fucking be lazy. OK, he would wake my ass up with the kick of the door. Get the fuck out of that fucking bed, boy. If I was one minute past that fucking long clock getting off. He was a Navy man. No slacking in that fucking house. None. Shit was done. It was done on time. And it's the way it was. I did not want to disappoint that man. He was not my father, but I looked at him like he was. And every time he told me to do something, I was done. Already done, Pop. Already done. Took care of it. Good boy. Good boy. I, that's why I tell you, I wish he could see me now. I know my grandmother is in heaven. And if she can hear me, I know she probably regrets saying what she said, but I'm glad she said it because it motivated me like a motherfucker. It motivated me and pushed me like I am today still. I'm 50 fucking years old. And this shit jacks me the fuck up every time. I'm hard on my boys the same way. You need that. That's what a father's supposed to do. I'm not raising fucking kids to be their buddy, to be their friend. OK, I'm teaching them life skills. This fucking world is going to take from you. It's going to take. And if you're an adult, and you're working. You know what it feels like. It's, it's, it's not what you were hoping for when you were in school. I, mean, I can't wait to get out of high school. I'm going to do what the fuck I want. No, you're doing a whole lot more shit that you don't want to do for less money than you should fucking get. It's a lie. The American dream is a fucking lie. So you got to do something other than the American dream. You got to find your own way of doing it, your own business. You formulate your own approach to doing shit outside the lines they've colored for all of us to be within. Fuck that shit. So laziness is not where I am. I've not been lazy since I was 11 years old. I've worked all the time. And every time I put my hands to anything with the market, the end result, the destination is excellence. That's what I'm aiming for. That's the that's terminus. Excellence. And if you ain't doing that when you're doing this, studying and trying to learn and working towards it, you ain't gonna make it. So you gotta change your mindset and your outlook on how you're gonna approach learning, who you're gonna learn from. Is it a constant bunch of bullshit, nonsense, and drama? Or are you learning from somebody that's taking you into a chart saying, this is what the science behind this is. This is when it should do this. This is how it should happen. This is what it should look like. And does it fucking repeat? Is other people making money? Are they proving that this shit works? Is it transferable knowledge? Because if it's not transferable knowledge and it's all reckless bullshit where stop losses are ambiguous, well, sometimes I'll use a stop loss. Sometimes I won't. I'm going to go in and do full leverage to get back a loss because I have to have social equity increase on my Social media accounts can't be looking like I'm losing money when you're trading recklessly. All the emphasis is in the wrong shit. 
public approval. Fuck the public. I don't give a fuck if you like me. I don't care if you like me. I show you everything. My fucking mental baggage, my fucking weaknesses. I tell you everything. Everything. I pushed myself this week into a setting when I know I cannot do well. Just to prove to you, yes, this shit that I'm teaching you will fucking lose in areas where I tell you to avoid it. What I do? I get out there, two trades, losing trades. I could have kept that from you. I could have hid that from you. But I'm trying to communicate that if I'm going to do what everybody else is fucking doing, guess what? I'm going to have the same lackluster results that they're going to have. Shit results is what it is. I don't want that. I, don't, I, I can't tolerate that. I'm not wired for that shit. I want precision. It may elude me at execution here or there. I don't give a fuck. I'm aiming in the right direction. I'm aiming for excellence. I'm going to hit it every fucking time. Every time. Perfection might miss the bullseye on that one, but excellence, that's where the fuck I reside. I live there. And you need to change your fucking address. You need to reside in Excellenceville. Okay? Right now, you're, you're hanging around people on social media. These motherfuckers don't know how to do anything. Nothing but influence and, and, and create worshipers. I don't want you to worship me. Don't worship me. Put your fucking sleeves, roll up, show up, take notes, learn. At the end of the year, you're going to be a different fucking person. Period. This is the way it is. If you put in the time and do exactly what I tell you to do and avoid all the other shit, you will be able to do this. Between the high and the low, everybody ignores that. The books talk about, give me the entry signal at the top, at the diversions, at the, at the pattern height in a bearish scenario. And the target, well, it might get down there. We don't know for certain. Here's the thing. I'm teaching you. You don't need that to happen. How liberating is that? How fucking liberating is that? Because I struggled in the beginning to make this shit go to the targets that these books said they were supposed to happen. And sometimes they never even got close. They never would even fucking get remotely close to it. But I would still buy another book by that author. Because that's the secret. The next book, that's the fucking one. He's going to tell me. He's going to tell me. He's just, he's just making me hold out for it. He wasn't you know, stupid. He put his logic into uh, multiple books. So I got to keep buying his books. And it was just one more fucking thing that would compound my confusion. So I said, fuck this shit. Indicators and new indicators and new settings and the logic of why you use this setting count for RSI and use this setting for stochastics and smooth the percent D and the percent K to this level. Fuck all that. All that effort, all that time and concern about a fucking indicator. If I just would have applied that time and energy on reading what the open, high, low, and close is and understanding liquidity and the element of time, that's what I was looking for all along. That's exactly what you're looking for, but you can't recognize it because you listen to all this other bullshit from other people. Because you've probably seen them make a trade it was profitable. Maybe they take money out of a funded account. Maybe they've done other shit. They've shown profitability. None of that shit is what makes markets go up and down. They just got lucky like I did in the beginning. That's all it is. And money management has preserved them. That's all it is. Now, what happens, folks? What happens when you take the best of money management and risk management and you couple it with highly precise, time-based price action? Think. Think. You see what I demonstrate every week. That, to me, that to me, folks, if I was seeing someone do what I've been showing you all for years, proving executions, it's in there. It's undeniable logic before it happened. You sat with me last week and I called every one minute candle perfectly. Told you when it was likely to reverse, why it would be reversing. And it fucking reversed and I showed you how to stop loss could be protected. And then boop, it was up. That's not guesswork. 
That's not cherry picking. That's sound logic that repeats every fucking day. And they can't hide it from you. They can't change it from you. It can't be changed. It's the way it is, folks. And I can't say any more than that. I promise you, it's not going to change. You're going to get trades wrong. There's going to be crazy movements that come out of nowhere sometimes, and it's going to probably hurt your account, hurt other people. It doesn't change anything. That's manipulation. That's the category you just, okay, that was something I couldn't control. Nobody could have made money in that situation. It is what it is. Continue on. Resume back to what you're looking for. Time and price. You're not getting caught up. <gasps> I just had two losing trades. Something's different now. Nothing's different except for the account balance. Continue on. It'll take care of itself. So take your attention to the meat on the middle of the bone. That's where you can always find your end meat. You all want to do like I did, catch the highest high and the lowest low. Because unless you do that, you're not successful. You're not worth talking about. When I was on America Online, my first was coming up. I wanted to be able to go on America Online. Message boards back then is how we were doing things. And I wanted to talk about how I got in this trade at the highest high and got out at the lowest low. That was my pursuit. That was my goal. That was whole, the whole reason why I was wanting to trade because I wanted the public approval. <clears throat> I wanted to have people. Look at me like a hero. Think about that now. Contrast it with what I do today. I can do this stuff for now. I won't be able to do it later on when I'm older. Mental faculties will diminish. I hope I don't experience that because I, I don't ever want to live a day where I can't do what I'm doing. That would be, that would be hell for me. I wouldn't want to be able to do that. But I can look back and say how I would have always been striving to do what I'm doing and capable of doing right now and wanted, encouraged public worship because I needed it. I was a young man looking for approval. I had lost my grandfather, the one I lived with and helped deliver picnic tables on his cash business he ran. I didn't get that talk like you're getting from me right now, like I used to get from him all the time. He never sat down, son, and say to me, son, you know, I love you. You're making me proud. You're doing this and you're doing that. He was a Navy man. But I knew he loved me. I knew when I did hit the mark, he'd say, good boy. And the only time I heard him ever say, I'm proud of you, is when I graduated high school. And he said he wasn't going to go that day. And I was sitting up on the bleachers and I saw his green pickup truck pull in in the parking lot. And he walked in, leaned in the doorway, watched me walk across and got in his truck and drove away. Two days I waited for him to say something about how he saw me go across the stage to get my diploma. I said, I saw you at the back of the stadium. I'm proud of you, boy. I give everything I got to hear him say it again. He was a hard man to be under, but I miss him. And I know learning from me isn't easy, but it works. It works and other people out there that are putting the work behind it, they're seeing the results. And you will too. And they're all going to come to you at a different time schedule. How long is it going to take? I don't know. Some of you, you might go through this with me. In four months, something clicks. And all of a sudden, you're like, oh, shit, I see it. I see what I'm supposed to be looking for. That's mine. That's, this is my model. And that feeling, that, that fucking confidence, that fucking dialed in moment, you know exactly what you, because you don't know shit right now. None of you do. None of you know what the fuck you're doing. None of you know what you're looking for. But when you finally do, 
Nothing I'm ever going to say, anybody else is going to say, is ever going to distract you. This is the thing that you're going in there looking for each time. And it's the same fucking shit repeating all the time. That's your model. You're not going to be influenced by how much money I show I make, how much the other students are making. That's their setup. That's their model. That's not yours. And guess what? There's lots of models and they all could be operating in the same direction or the opposite direction. And it's all right. It sounds like it can't be possible, but it's true. It's absolutely fucking true. But you got to give yourself a real chance. Aren't you fucking worth it? Think about it. You're, you're, you're worrying about how long it's going to take for you to learn. How long do you plan on living? How do you want those years alive to be lived? Aren't you worth 2023? Aren't you worth putting in the effort that you see other people outside of me literally making real fucking money? Do you think that you or anybody else is going to convince them that they wasted their time? No. Just like no one's going to be able to convince you when you start doing it that you've wasted your time. You're going to wish that you started sooner. You're going to wish that you would have found this shit years ago. Like every one of my sexual students, once they fucking taste it and see, once they deal with it themselves and they can find it without me pointing to it, they all say the same thing. I wish I would have known this this long ago. And it's always before they started trading. Because they all did what I did and everybody else has done too. They dabbled in bullshit. And the only thing happens when you mess around with shit, you get your hands dirty and it stinks. Nothing comes out good when you're messing around with bullshit. Nothing. You bring bullshit into the conversation. You bring bullshit into the learning process. You're going to get shit at the end. No matter how you slice it, this is the way it is. You cannot polish a turd. That's the bottom line. And retail bullshit is just that. It puts your mindset on the wrong things. You focus on the wrong stupid shit instead of the principles that make you consistent. Where's the market going next? Not here's an entry strategy. Why the fuck should I be taking that entry? What's the, what's the catalyst, the rhyme and reason why the market should be even going up? Fuck your harmonic pattern targets. I don't give a shit about that. Why should it go up there? Not because there's an overlapping of Fibonacci and bullshit. Elliott Weave counts are adding up to this and that, and it's a supply demand zone. No, 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 no. Who's getting their ass handed to them next? That's what the market's doing. Okay. It's going on a schedule when volume comes into the marketplace. Who's making money right now and who feels the safest? That's what's getting banged next. This is a carnivorous endeavor, folks. You vegans out here, you want to come in here and pretend like everything is love and peace. This is fucking war. It's fucking war. If you're on the other side of my trade and I win, I don't feel bad for you. I don't feel comp you know, a compassion for you. You knew what the risks were when you signed up and you opened your account. That's what the fine print says. You're going to likely lose your fucking money and you're going to lose it to people that know what they're doing. Me and my students. It's a tuition. Everybody pays it. Everybody pays it. And there's a membership fee that every year you have to pay that too. That's drawdown. Everybody has it. But to be a card carrying member of this club, you got to know what the fuck you're doing. An image has nothing to do with it. Listen, folks. A demo. I got almost a half a, thousand, a half a million people and 200,000 people now on Twitter listen to me blue eat about shit like this. And 99% of it's been done on the demo. Why? Why are you listening to me? Because you see it working still. You can appreciate the fact that I am not a licensed financial advisor. So I'm not going to put you in live trades. I'm not going to put you in front of an audience of other Folks that are watching me do it with a live account because I'm not going to entice you to do that. I'm not going to represent a broker. I'm not going to tell you to go with a broker. I'm not an introducing broker. I'm not going to go with a funding account. I'm not going to do any of those things. I stay in a gray area that keeps me absolutely 100% safe. And I don't give a fuck. 
who doesn't like the fact that I'm not doing it in a live account in front of you. I'm not obligated to do that shit. Nobody is. I don't give a fuck what your opinion is, but you ain't going to do anything better than me. And some of you have seen proof. You don't need live account. You don't need anything else. You know what you found right now, the resource that you tapped into here and costing you no fucking money is building you up. I'm encouraging you to stick with it because if you do, time will do its work. But you have to keep showing up. You got to keep doing that part. And give yourself the chance. Really give yourself the chance. How would you feel if your relationship, the person you were with, said, listen, <clears throat> you're going to have to make all my fucking dreams come true in 120 days or I'm not staying with you. Or you're in a relationship right now. And they come up and say, hey, look, listen, uh, you're going to make all my fantasies and all my wild wants and desires to come to pass in this relationship in the next 20 days. Or I'm, I'm leaving you. Is that a fair request? Is that a reasonable request? Fuck no. No way. I am coming to you every week. And I'm pouring myself into you. You may not think that you're worth it yet, but I do. Because I know what you're capable of when you can't even see it in yourself yet. I was that 11-year-old boy at 20, needing what I'm trying to be for you. I know what you're looking for. I know exactly what it is. But I'm also smart enough to know that everything that I know isn't going to work for every one of you. You only need one piece of it. The piece that everybody needs to know, though, is how to read the tape. How to understand what price is going to do. Why should these markets go up to this level? Why should it go down to this level? When should it do it? And if it is really there, and that market's likely to deliver to a specific level above or below, where is it that you can capitalize on that move and manage risk and not get stopped out? Or if you do get stopped out, is there a way to get back in and not be over leveraging or pushing it? I'm going to teach you that then. As well this year. Everything that a trader would want to know. That's what you're going to get from me. You're going to see it on live charts. There's no hiding it. There's no alternative view. There's no plan A, plan B, and whichever one. That's the one we were right about. No safety net. It works or it doesn't, right? So just relax. Relax. We have a whole year. A whole year together. It's going to be fun. I promise you it will be boring sometimes, but you're going to feel the growth every single week. You're going to know more about yourself. Probably more than you were hoping to learn, <laughs> but don't shy away from that because those characteristics that you're bringing in your personality, those elements are going to be the very things that are going to be an impediment to you doing well. Even the things you think are strengths in your character right now, they're probably going to be the things that cause you to struggle the most. I'm confident in myself. I was confident too. I was overconfident. So much so that I was taking trades without stop losses. And then that day, <laughs> my account was roasted. So don't think that your strengths outside of trading are going to be strengths in your trading. Many times that's going to be the vice that you fail to. So you have to be humble when you're arrogant. And you have to be confident when you are less than confident in your life outside of trading. You have to turn everything upside down here. Everything has to be on the, on the upside down. Everything that you think works doesn't. The things that lead to profitability doesn't. The things that don't readily appear as profitable, that's what we do. When you take a long trade, you put your stop loss below the most recent swing low. Okay. 
that logic that you think as a retail trader protecting you, that insurance policy, we target that. That's, that's our premise here. We cannibalize those that feel safe. When they put their walls up on their chart, they think that's a fortress protecting them. Like that swing low is going to keep price at bay. When we storm that wall, tear through it, we take their money, we take their trade, we take their liquidity. And in some instances, we take their hope. I don't feel bad for that. I grew out of that. You'll grow out of that too. Everybody in the marketplace is at war with everyone else. This is not a team. All I'm doing is creating warriors. You're all learning how to do combat in these charts. But don't lose sight. Because if you are foolish enough to take something on the opposite end of my trade and I can take your money, I'm doing it gladly with no remorse. None. That's how this business operates. And it creates a conundrum for some folks. This is unethical. This is not Christian. This is not what a good person would do. Well, we're given resources. And if we don't maximize those resources, we're being wasteful. And you are learning a skill set. You're learning a mindset. You're learning a process and processes to be able to go in confidently and engage. It does not mean an absolute guarantee that you're going to be profitable without any losing trades or transactions. You're going to. I'm promising you that's going to happen. I'm guaranteeing you that you're going to lose on some of these transactions. It does not and it should not diminish your belief in the idea that the market's book like this. It just means that you brought human frailty into the equation and you did it wrong. That's how we look at every single loss. Guess what that teaches? Personal responsibility versus, oh, this fucking harmonic pattern. Oh, this so-and-so setup failed me. No. You got stopped out. Who got stopped out? You fucking got stopped out. The trade is unaware. You can't personify the setup. You got to take the root cause back to the operator, the person that pushed the button. Your broker didn't do that. Your spouse didn't do that. Your coworkers didn't do that. I sure as fuck didn't do it. So personal responsibility is yours. You own that. And that's a good thing. That's a strength. Because guess what that teaches you? You can climb out of all of that losing. No matter how long it takes you, drawdown is going to always manifest itself. But the length of time in drawdown will reduce over time. In the beginning, when you're learning how to do this, you'll have periods of drawdown. It takes a little bit more time to come out of that. And then over time, you're going to see that managing risk properly, drawdown is unavoidable. You're going to have losing trades. You're going to be human. You're going to do something wrong. You're going to have a case of the ass because your spouse, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your boss, you just don't feel good. You want to have a feel good moment. You're going to break the fucking rules. The sign says don't step on the grass and you're going to walk on the fucking grass. You're going to do things what humans do all the time. They fuck up. You're going to put a trade on knowing damn well you shouldn't have done it. And you're going to fucking regret it. Guess what? That's human. You're going to think you're going to be able to outperform your system and you're going to fuck up. And that's human. Who's, whose responsibility is it? Yours. Who can you blame? No one. But when you get yourself out of those pickles, <laughs> it's stupid when you do it, but you also know that, oh, that was a dumb mistake. Let me just fix that next time. I won't do that anymore. No I'll do something else. That's human. That's humanity in trading. That's where everybody blows it because the folks that are not disciplined, when they make those human errors that are going to manifest themselves in anything and everything, no matter what system you trade with, no matter what guru you listen to, whatever your teacher, your mentor, whatever the fuck you want to call it, 
all of that stuff leads to you doing something as a result. But they, they act as a catalyst. And when we win, listening to our educator or our system creator, we like to do what? Think team mentality. Yes. Thank you, ICT. Thank you, Larry Williams. Thank you, whatever the fuck you want to put at the top of the list, the person you listen and learn from. And when we lose, ugh, I'm a fuck up. I can't make this work. No. I don't deserve, any other mentor out there doesn't deserve the credit. When you take on the risk yourself, you manage that risk effectively, and then you profit from it. I don't ever want to glad hand any of that. You fucking earned that. That's yours. You want to peacock around and fucking go on social media, and that's your that's your vice? Fuck it. Do it. I don't think that should be the uh, deciding factor for why you are trading, which is most of what the young guys are doing today. But you earned that shit. Peacock around like a motherfucker. Mick Jagger your shit. You got the moves. Move them. Show it to everybody. Who gives a fuck? I'd love to see it. <laughs> but I'm not going to say high five. Yeah, you owe it all to me. Fuck that shit. You took on all the risk. You did the work. I don't deserve, and the mentors out there don't fucking deserve the worship. Stop doing that shit. You did it yourself. You fucking earned it. You did it. So no one fucking co-signs your success. You own that. But there's a flip side to that coin. When you fuck up, you do not fault your mentor, your teacher, your friends and your fucking neighbors and your Discord channel and your Telegram channel and your Facebook group or your Twitter group. You own it. And that, my friends and neighbors, is very, very painful. Because we all want the insurance policy to be able to say, well, when I lost money, it's that motherfucker's fault. He didn't talk about that in the video. He never said this in his fucking mentorship. He never told me when I should have got out of that trade. He knew damn well it was going to do this. And he didn't say nothing in his Twitter feed. You all want the insurance policy to be able to say, if I lose money, I can always just fault that guy. That person, that system, that approach, that service. When none of that puts your ass in the trade, but you. You need to be able to be responsible with your own actions. And this generation is not being taught responsibility at all. And that's unfortunate because that's the number one reason why they don't like me. Because I'm telling them continuously in boring conversations that don't feel comfortable listening to. But guess what? Trading is fucking war. It's war. It's not a fucking video game, folks. It's not. It's just going to fucking take your ass and grind it to bits if you let it. So you have to prepare yourself mentally, emotionally, psychologically, that you're going to wrestle with yourself a lot. And some of you are going to get this guilty conscience that I got to tell them. ICT, you know, thank you, or I'm not going to, I'm going to be jinxed if I, if I don't say thank you, ICT, because I made money, I'm going to be jinxed. I'm not going to be able to be successful. Stop fucking worshiping. You did something, share it. I love it. I'm not, psh, high five, man. You, you owe all to me. You don't owe shit to me. You didn't pay me. I'm here because I want to fucking be here. But I want to see what you do. I want to see it. Not just the good. I want to see the bad because I want to see how you learn from that shit. I was reading a young lady in the, um, in the Twitter uh, feed. She said something to the fact that she made a mistake or whatever. And I said, learn from it. Forgive yourself and learn from it. Because in the beginning, I didn't forgive myself. I began to hate myself. And the more hatred I had because I couldn't do it fast enough, it began to began to manifest itself. And when I would make money, I would become an arrogant prick. And my friends would see it. And one of my friends who I was no longer a friend now, um, he had the balls to tell me to my face. Like, dude, like, what the fuck do you think you're doing? Like, you're just like us. You're just making money. 
You're no better than us. We graduated the same fucking year in school. You know, we worked menial fucking jobs. Okay, now you're making money. You think you're better than everybody else. Let me tell you something. That was a kick in the dick. I needed it, but that was really uncomfortable. Really uncomfortable. Here's a guy that I looked at as like a brother to me. I'm like, what the fuck did you just say to me? Dude, what the hell? But that's what a real friend does. They'll call your bullshit. And they'll do it because they want to see you recognize the mistakes you're making. This generation, you don't see people half the time. You're talking to them through social media. So you've got iron balls that you wouldn't say none of that shit if you were face to face with them. And it causes a disconnect socially, but it also encourage you, encourages you to do things that are toxic. And this generation, unfortunately, has been created to be the worst of the worst. And some of you that are going to do well in this, you're going to see what I mean by that, by coming out of whatever the fuck you're involved in right now. The way kids are taught in school today, ass backwards. It's all about feelings and social approval. Listen, folks. There's going to be people out there that don't like you. No matter how nice you are and whatever you want to do, you can give the fucking world to them. They're still going to find fault in you. They're going to tell you you're full of shit. You're an asshole. You should have done it sooner. What took you so fucking long, you asshole? You gave everything away for free. Why didn't you have to fucking uh, make me wait? Uh, you should have did this sooner. You're always going to have that. There's assholes in everything. Everything. You're never going to please everybody. You're not going to. So don't let this endeavor be a reason for you to go and say, okay, I want to be successful so I can go out on social media and be approved and accepted by my friends and people I don't even know. Because these people don't fucking give a shit about you. They're not tucking you in bed at night. They're not paying your bills when you fuck up. They're not going to give you a handout. So why does their opinion or their approval of you right now or in the future matter at all? That's not a reason to be fucking trading. And these young boys out here, they're fucking on social media. That's all they're doing. They're catering to something that doesn't mean a fuck. Versus trying to build a life for themselves, find a significant other to have a relationship with, and being happy and content and not giving a fuck who likes them, worships them, thinks that they should have done it better or isn't doing it as good as the next guy. Fuck all that. You only have one life here. There's no dress rehearsals. And you're going to come into this world like everybody else does without, a, without an instruction manual. Because you are a work in progress. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to fuck up all the time. The rest of your life, you're going to make mistakes. Every single day, you're making mistakes. The difference is you are comfortable with certain mistakes that you make because you understand that that was probably not the best thing you should have done. And there it is. It's done. It didn't take anything from you except for the nuisance of having gone through it. Perfect, perfect example. In front of my house, the new one, I got these pillars out there. One's by my mailbox and the other one is it's got like landscaping and such. And it has three little bulbs in the light. I had to go out yesterday, replace two of the bulbs. It was a pain in the ass to get my hand up inside this contraption to try to get these Little tiny little skinny candlestick type flame shaped bulbs. I knew, I knew I only had three bulbs left, but I had to replace two. So I brought one extra. I reached my hand up in there. I know what I'm doing. I'm doing too fast because I don't want to be doing what I'm doing. And I know as soon as I get it done, I'm going to run back in there and I'm going to probably realize I didn't do something right. I'm not a handyman. I'm being honest with you, okay? I got a checkbook. I pay people to do shit for me. But here I am. I'm trying to put my fucking hand up inside this contraption to change the bulb. And I drop the bulb. It hits one of the rocks in the landscaping, and it breaks the bulb. Now, if I would have listened to my internal voice that said, slow the fuck down, Huddleston, I wouldn't have done that. But... The wisdom in me said, take all of the fucking bulbs you have because the chances of you being in Huddleston here is likely. Okay, so 
I dropped it. I broke it. I had the other two still to replace them. That's my fucking stop loss. That's my risk management. It was unpleasant. I hated the whole fucking idea of me going out there doing that. But I used what I do in my market trading out there. I had funded the position. <laughs> I had resources in case I did get stopped out. That ball broke. But I'm not out of the game, and I still got what I needed because I had a partial. Now, if I didn't take the extra ball, and I'm walking out there yesterday, and the wind's blowing me in the face, and I'm just wearing my pajamas and my T-shirt with slips on, no socks, and it's cutting through me cold, and I'm up here trying to dig my hand underneath this fixture that covers the bulbs. I don't know why they designed it this way, but I'm probably doing it wrong anyway. But if I wouldn't have brought the extra bulb, and I would have dropped that fucking bulb like I did, and it broke, or if I didn't have the extra bulb, that would have took me out of my whole show yesterday and would have pissed me off. Because shit happens. But I didn't have the resources or the mindset to deal with it appropriately. But because I know, chances are I'm going to walk out there. I'm going to be rushing because I'm not taking the time to put the jacket on. Because I want to walk on the ground that says don't walk on the grass. Okay, I'm going to do the things I'm being told I can't do and shouldn't do. So the human part of me is doing exactly what the fuck you're going to do when you start trading or start watching these live streams. You're going to feel the impulse to do the very things I'm telling you not to fucking do, and you're still going to do it. Whose fault is it when it hurts you? Yours. But you don't want that responsibility. You don't want that. You want the responsibility of being able to take all the clout when you win. Put a ICT, I made this trade because you want other people to like your post. And I get it. That's cool. I'll like it. If, it's, if you're doing what you're supposed to do, I'll like it. But I want you to be cognizant to the effect that you are expected to be responsible, not just clout chasing or looking for approval or an attaboy or at a girl, pat on the back. You got to be responsible. When you make a mistake, own it. I want to see more of that this year. I want to see I did this wrong. This is what I was expecting to happen. This is what I felt while I was doing it, and it didn't pan out, and this is exactly how I feel right now. That's what I want to see. I want to see that. And I want other people to see how much of that occurs. Because on social media, there is some cherry picking going on on social media. They only want to give you what makes them feel good about themselves. And in trading, you can't do that. You can't hide it. It's going to show up in your bottom line. Your equity curve is going to give a storyline. And that storyline isn't always a love story. Sometimes it's a fucking tragedy. Sometimes it's a horror fucking story. And sometimes it's a fucking sequel. Many times over. And it becomes a fucking enterprise. A blown account after blown account. Until the trader learns that these are things that shouldn't be repeated. So... I want to make sure that we have beat this to death. And I'm sure I'll be doing more of it before we get to February 7th. I don't want the folks like the young man that sent me the tweet the other day saying he's got his account ready to follow me in live. The fact that you have mentioned that you have your account ready, that signals that you're doing everything I tell my students not to do. You shouldn't even have a paper, uh, paper trading account linked to TradingView. While you're watching me. Because it's going to be enticement. You're not going to be able to. If you're not capable of managing yourself. And controlling yourself and being disciplined. You're going to do things. That's going to be distracting. And if you do something. That you know now. That you have been told multiple times not to do. Are you going to be listening to my narrative about why price should be doing what it's doing and what it should be doing next and what you don't want to be seeing. Are you going to hear that and let it resonate with you and take it as experience while you're in a trade and you're only giving a fuck about whether or not it's going to go to profit or if it's going to stop you out? And what if you're in a trade and you don't trust where I think the market's not going to go and you're scared that it's going to stop you out 
and you get out of trade, and then it runs in the favor of what your trade was outlined to do. Who are you going to blame then? You're going to be mad. And you missed the entire point of the lecture over live charts. You missed it. And even watching it in hindsight won't allow you to retain it because you're going to be bitter about what the fuck you were doing goofing around. Are you worth investing the time this year in yourself the right way? I'm telling you, if you do anything outside of what I'm telling you to do, you're fucking doing it wrong. And the results won't come. You need it to be boring. You need it to be just observing one thing. Each day we're watching price and seeing how it moves and gyrates. And you'll get comfortable with seeing how it does this certain thing over and over and over again. It repeats these certain signatures that over and over again happens. And then by doing that, the setup that you don't even understand exists right now will literally come to life right in front of you in your chart. It will start resonating with you that this is the particular pattern that you like seeing me talk about. I may not even be referring to it as a trade for myself. But because I'm saying it should do this and then do that, you're like, I can see five handles in that. And then next time you do it, same thing happened. You, you already know what I'm going to say before I start saying it because you see that thing forming. He keeps talking about this, but I see this. So that's my setup. That's my model. That's my multiplier. That's the thing I'm going to gravitate to in trading. And then you work with that and let it grow. And you build more understanding as we go throughout the rest of the year. And then you start seeing more things build on that. And then your five handle moves become easily 15 handles and 10 handles, 20 handles, and then 15 handles, and then 30, 50 handles, and then five handles. And then back and forth, there's an ebb and flow. And you'll see how many times. How often does a 50 handle move occur in a month? When is it realistic to expect one? When should you only be focusing on five handles and be thankful that you got that and be out for the rest of the day? You're going to learn all that stuff. But I can't and no one else can communicate it in a book. You can't. You can't do it. It cannot be done. Trust me, if people were able to do it and they could encapsulate it inside of a book, it'd be out there everywhere and everybody would be copying it like they're doing me now. Making books and shit. They have no idea what the fuck they're talking about. Smart money concepts. You just got introduced to the idea, folks. Just take your shoes off. Get comfortable. You're going to be here for a year. You're going to see all kinds of cool shit. And it's for you to learn and become better at it. Not fall victim to people that don't know how to do it. It's my prayer, honestly, for all of you to really find yourself in this. Even if you use other stuff in addition to what I teach. If it aligns with what you're doing, the times that it aligns, I'm confident, I'm absolutely confident that it will improve your understanding about price. And that's all I want. I just want to, I just want to be a help. That's all. That's all I want from all of you is to give me the opportunity to help you. That's all I'm asking for. You don't have to go out of your way, you know, to, to constantly keep thanking me. We see enough of that already. Just put the work in and show me your results. That's all I'm wanting, okay? Because I know the rest will take care of itself. And once you get to that point, that confidence level, so you think right now, now I'm saying this and I'm going to close it. Right now you have your job, or maybe you don't have a job, okay? Maybe you just recently got laid off, fired, the company went out of business, something to that effect. But no longer you, you have a job. Before that happened, you probably felt real confident that as long as you keep showing up to work, you got a job. That's a false sense of security. But you've lied to yourself and convinced yourself that it's true. Those working right now having a job, your job's not guaranteed to you, no matter how much you want to talk yourself into it. Oh, they need me. They don't fucking need you. They don't need you. You are just a number to them. One little small cog in the machine. 
and that cog that you represent is easily replaced by somebody else for less money. That's the, that's the environment they're creating right now. You don't see it, but it's what's happening. You're going to see a lot of people losing their jobs and folks that are in college right now. <sighs> You're going through school, working very diligently, I'm sure, studying and trying to carve out a certificate. Nothing guarantees you a job with that certificate. I had a GPA just under 4%. Math and science major. I, I was, I was, that was like me. That was me. I was writing programs in sixth grade after school. All from books that I got from the library. I wanted to be a, a video game maker. That's That was my aspirations as a, as a little boy. In Middle River School, in sixth grade, the math teacher that everybody fucking hated, I loved him. Because when school ended, he, he let me stay until he left for the day. He let me code. And I was just doing little games and hangman and things like that with basic language. And I was learning to code right then and there. And that was better than any college course I went through with programming because I was passionately seeking how to do it on my own. Instead of going to a class and listening to a guy bloviate about shit that you know, may or not even be that the best way of doing it. But you're following a process. You paid for these credits. You're going to the class, whether it be online or in person. And you're expecting to fulfill this GPA to pass it. And then you get your certificate. And that certificate means fuck all. But well done. You wasted time and money investing in something like everybody else does in every other pursuit. Unless you secure the job. Now, if you get the job and you love your job and you make really good money, then you are a success. But what happens, and I'm just posing this as an argument here, what happens if you work really hard to get through that college and you get your certificate and you get a high GPA and you get hired to the job you're trying to go after and you make the money, maybe even more than you were hoping to make. But then you find out you fucking hate it. Do you have a plan B for that? Most people don't. A lot of people go through college, work very hard, do very well, get into the career they thought they wanted to do. When they get in it, they don't like it. Do you have an alternative? Because that's a lot of time and money to be investing in and not knowing for certain. Versus a skill set like this that can be a complement to anything that you're doing in life. Another stream of income that will help maybe replace whatever mistake you made as a career pursuit or fulfill something that you failed in because some of you dropped out of college. Some of you failed in college. There's room for all of you here. All of you have a place at this table. And you can come from all different walks of life. Impoverished nations well-to-do. I have all kinds of students and they're doing well. Not every one of them, but I have students across a wide spectrum of different demographics, countries, language barriers, all of that stuff. Wasn't, it wasn't formidable enough to keep them from planning success. So you have no excuse this year. None. Not a valid one, at least. Are you going to show up every day? Are you going to dismiss anybody and anything that would be a distraction to you learning? My advice to you, and I mean this sincerely, don't talk about it. Okay? This is Fight Club. You ever seen the movie Fight Club? First rule of Fight Club, we don't talk about Fight Club. That's the first rule. That means you can't hear someone else's asinine opinion about what you're doing and learning unless you invite them in the conversation. They're not going to tell you what you want to hear. They have no idea what the fuck you're doing. And if you try to explain to them, they're not going to understand. They're going to think you're fucking crazy. 
First rule of Fight Club, we don't talk about Fight Club. That means your friends at work, you work with them. That's it. You don't make them partners in your endeavor on learning how to trade. You're not taking them out of that fucking job when you start making money, right? So why the fuck are you bringing them along right now? You want them to feel like you're getting ready to make some changes, man. You're making some fucking waves, and you're riding that motherfucker out on your surfboard and leaving them behind. And you want them to know about it before it even starts. Don't. When they come to work and you ain't there no more, then they'll know. Send them a fucking card three weeks later. I'm on the beach. Fuck off. See you. Your family. First World Fight Club. We don't talk about Fight Club. Because they're not going to tell you what you want to hear. They're only going to tell you their fears and the reasons why they wouldn't do it. So why the fuck are you going to invite them in the conversation? They won't understand what you're doing. You barely do. So why are you allowing anybody else outside of what you're trying to learn to influence you? Because they're going to influence you. Why? Because you love them. That's normal. I did the same thing. And not one of my family members, not fucking one of them, said, you know what? Michael, you fucking deserve that shit. If anybody's going to do it, boy, you are going to do it. You're going to fucking be the trailblazer. You're the fucking one. Not one of them even gave me a fucking encouragement. Oh, like, I hope you do well. All of them said, yeah, right. You're going to be just like the rest of us. The rest of us? The rest of us? Motherfuckers, you, you retired. We're still working in retirement right now. I've been retired. Every one of my family members has money owed on their fucking homes if they own one. I have family members in my wife's side that are all broke. And I've tried helping them. I've put them in homes. I've put them in vehicles. I've given them money. And they still shit the fucking bed and blow themselves out. Some people you can't help. You can't help everybody in your family. And you think... I'm going to tell my friends because I love them. They're my boys. They're my girls. It's my clique. It's my people. It's my tribe. This is my, it's my circle. I'm looking out for them. I'm going to tell them what I'm doing. That's what multi-level multi marketing capitalizes on, the tendency for humans to want to do that. I'm telling you, don't. See a difference in the way I'm teaching? I'm upside down to everything else because this is what works. Fuck the bullshit. Your friends are going to want to learn what you're doing once you arrive. Then you'll have experience. Then you can probably tell them better. Right now, it's a pipe dream to you and them until you really do it. Stop making your fucking business somebody else's business to run. Mind your own fucking business. And don't let nobody else run your fucking business. They ain't going to run it like it needs to be ran. Their input is menial, not menial and minuscule compared to what you're expected to do on your own here, putting the work in, showing up every fucking day. They're going to take days off, every fucking day off to them. And you're going to let them into the conversation by saying, here's what I'm doing. I'm going to be doing this. This is my goals. And they're going to feel like what? Oh, shit. They got a goal. They're trying to do something. Most people don't. They're trying to muster up enough strength to get out of fucking bed to drag their ass to work. And you're talking to them how you're going to change your whole fucking family tree. You're changing the whole trajectory of your finances going forward. Supercharging it for all of your siblings and, and offspring behind you once you arrive. Nobody wants to hear that, especially when they have no resolutions in their own life. Consider your friends right now. Who among your friends are successful? Chances are you probably don't have many friends that are successful. Most people don't. I didn't. I was the one. I was the one that grew up out of all that bullshit. And I tried my ass off to bring them with me. I, I had just barely enough, sometimes not enough, to keep myself going, let alone encourage them when they felt the adversities. 
So you're asking to win something that you can't win. That's a, that's a battle that you can't win. You can't encourage them when you haven't done it yet. And the only thing you're really doing is wanting them to think that you're making money moves. Hashtag making money moves, baby. You're living social media. That's what you're doing with your fucking friends face to face. The best thing you can do is don't invite them to shit that you ain't proven to yourself yet. And don't invite criticism when you haven't even found your way yet. First rule of Fight Club, we do not talk about Fight Club. You don't tell your friends, you don't tell your family, you don't tell your co-workers what you're trying to learn here. Because they're all going to give you a report card. And they're going to give you an interim report. So, uh, how you doing in your so-and-so? Making any money yet? I see you're still coming to work, motherfucker. That's what you're going to get. That's what I got. Until that day. <laughs> until that fucking day when we... Yeah, we gave me the move I was looking for. Fuck all of you. I'm out. Peace. And I told him, keep my last fucking paycheck. And I never came back for it. And he never mailed it. Think about that. <laughs> yes, that's what it felt like. I didn't give a fuck. And you won't give a fuck either. You won't care about all the people that you know would have doubted you if you would brought them into the conversation. But don't bring them into it. Don't do that. Because it's going to be a distracting. Because you love your friends. And you should. Their extended family. And you love your family. Even though it's dysfunctional as these motherfuckers are, you love them. You don't want them over your fucking house on Christmas. You don't want to see them on Thanksgiving, but you still love them. But these are the same motherfuckers that you're about to invite to the board meeting of the corporation you. You incorporated. You're, in, you're making them fucking honorary board members of you incorporated. What the fuck are you doing that for? You already don't want to spend time with them, but you're going to invite them to the conversation about how you're going to find success doing this. Don't do that. Don't do it. You're setting yourself up for failure right away because it's going to be mentally draining. Not only do you have to keep up with the pace I'm going to put you through and the natural learning curve of going through the process yourself, because this shit isn't easy. You have to wrestle with yourself. And you're inviting all of the toxicity that lazy motherfuckers that everybody has in their family and their friends and their co-workers. Look at what your co-workers, look what you get away with at work. Some of you motherfuckers are listening to me fucking off on Twitter spaces while I'm going off. And you should be working. You're cheating the man. You're getting paid to do something, and your head's in the fucking charts, listening to ICT fucking videos on the sly, keeping your fucking phone hidden underneath your fucking coffee cup, moving shit. Oh, let me see where he's at right now. Yeah, I'm gonna tell you. you know the fuck I'm talking about. You know exactly what I'm talking about. So if you're trying to cut corners and slacking off, how do you think your friends and coworkers are going to feel when you start finding success? It's going to cause static. Versus, now let me give you the flip side of this, this is the right way of doing it, and I'm done. Quietly, quietly just go about your fucking business this year. Learning, collecting information, exercises, doing the drills, the homework assignments I'm going to put you through. Show up every day. You don't fucking talk about it. If you know your fucking spouse would lose their fucking mind about what you're doing here, just for this year, you don't say anything. If you can't make it work, it was no harm, no foul. You'll never hear them complain to you about, see, I told you, or you fucking did this and did that. Just quietly do it. It's not costing you any money. They're not going to be mad. But they will be mad if they think that you have emotionally and psychologically committed to something and then you can't find success with it. They're going to constantly find a way to constantly throw that bring that shit up in your face all the time. Remember that one time when you thought that guy on the internet, that fucking scammer, he said he's going to do this, do that, and all of a sudden, what happened? Nothing. You're still fucking working, you fucking failure. They're going to throw it up in your face. Maybe not to that degree, but it'll happen. It'll come up when you don't want it to. The best thing you can happen, the thing, best thing you can do is just go through the process of learning how to do this quietly. Keep it personal. Your business is your business. You're at the helm. 
Don't make no waves, there won't be no waves. No static unless you make it. And how you get static? You got to rub up against something. Friends and neighbors, co-workers. Keep this part away from everybody. Guard it. It's a seed right now. A small little seed. You can choke that seed. You don't want that to happen. Let it germinate. Let it do what it needs. Let it take some roots. And then when that bitch starts growing and producing fruit, you ain't going to need to talk about it. They're going to see it. You're going to be doing shit differently. And when they find it in their heart to ask you, hey, what are you doing differently? There's something peculiar about the way you're living your life now. What was the changes that made you do what you're doing here? You look like you're finding success. And what the fuck's going on? You stopped coming to work, man. Where you been? Then, guess what? You're equipped to talk about it. And you have been there. And you can say, yeah, you know, this is the way I learned it. And this is what the guy said I should have done. And he was right. And other people that aren't going to listen to this, they want their girlfriends to be a part of it. Mm -mm. Nope. A divided mind. Nope. Can't have it. Because you're all going to do things differently. You're going to see a buy. They're going to see a sell. Wait a minute. We'll make you. And you're going to get animosity like it was with my uncle when I tried to teach him what I was learning. I'm not sure if you heard that. That's my oldest son in the house. He's playing Xbox Live. <laughs> he must have killed somebody. The point is, Keep the focus on you. Do not invite other people to be able to provide you a commentary or give their opinion about why you're doing what you're doing, why it should be done differently, or why it's a waste of time. You taste it yourself. You find your own success, and everything that you would want to share with them, you'll have experience and the receipts to share, it, and you'll be much more effective in doing it. Right now, you don't know anything. You don't have any way of encouraging them except for the upside that's possibly there, but you don't know because you haven't done it yet. And you don't want to be that friend that got somebody involved in meme stocks like these people on Reddit did. How many people do you think had static in their friendships now after, hey, look, we're all in this Reddit group and this and that, and we're all going to make money because we're going to beat the hedge fund managers. Oh, they're all fucking broke now. Hedge fund manager is still there, but all those people on Reddit are regretting life right now. So don't invite toxicity. Don't make a divided mind condition where you have friends and family members or coworkers that you're trying to make profitable with you. Because I even did that with my uncle who knew about trading and was able to make money by luck and sugar, made some money, bought a condominium down in uh, Ocean Shore. Uh, I'm sorry, Ocean City, Eastern Shore of Maryland, which was an accomplishment back then. But uh, could, he couldn't find, he still can't. And he's, I'm going to be honest with you, he's miserable. He retired from Verizon, got a buyout from the Verizon, would spend an hour and a half one way driving down to Virginia from Maryland. Okay. It was more on his house than he has ever owed. And the house was $80,000 back in the 80s. And he owes more than that now in the hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt, retired. And once he retired, he ran a lawn cutting business. And now he's now delivering auto parts for, I don't know, some kind of auto parts place. And I asked him, I said, why are you working? No reply. He's miserable. He's not doing what he wanted to do as a young man. Because he had a taste of it and never could do it. And what was his problem? He couldn't accept me. He said it right from his own mouth when we drove around one day. And I told him, I said, I want to help you learn how to do this. He cried to me, broke down and cried and admitted. He goes, every time you tried to tell me something, I wanted to do whatever you said and do the opposite of it. Because I'm jealous. I, I brought you to this. When you were 15 years old, I was talking to you at your grandmother's house. 14 and 15 years old, he was talking to me all the time. Richest people in the world, Michael, trade futures and options. Get yourself a good job. Get go out there and become an electric, electronic technician, like he was at the time at Westinghouse. And learn how to trade futures. And I didn't want to hear that shit. 
I was like, what the fuck? I'm in martial arts. I don't give a shit. <laughs> I wasn't even interested in girls. And I was just, martial arts. I'm going to have my own martial arts school. And then here I am running up a, a fortune in his home, renting his bedroom from him for $50 a week. He watched me do it. And he and his wife would ask me to pay for vacations, pool liners when they needed one. New fence was the, the that was it. That was the breaker. For me, that's just like, you know what, I'm getting taken advantage of. Raise the rent if you want, okay, but stop asking me to pay for stuff. And I moved out. That was the that was the uncomfortable point I needed to get out of there. But I tried to teach him, and he wouldn't do it. Everything I said, he would do the opposite. And then when I heard him tell me in tears, he goes, I'm jealous because why does God let you do this and not let me? And I said, you ever stop and think that God allowed me to learn how to do this and now I'm your nephew and I could literally hold your hand doing it, but your ego and pride won't let you do that. Family members and friends aren't easy targets to save and change from their present state. You can't fix them. They want to fix themselves or they won't fix themselves. And my uncle was a perfect description of someone that's in denial. They don't want to learn from someone that knows how to do it because they have personal conflicts that they're wrestling with. Here I am. I'm sitting right there in front of them. I'm telling them, I'm buying this right now, Uncle Stan. Call your broker and do the same order right now. What does he do? He fades it and goes the other fucking direction and then loses his fucking money. And he's stomping around the fucking house, throwing shit around the house. And I'm like, what's wrong? You didn't get the target? Like, are you still holding it? No. I don't talk about it. And later on, he's pissed off smoking cigarettes and he's not a smoker. I'm like, what the fuck are you smoking cigarettes for? I just started. What? Something's wrong. <laughs> Something's wrong. You start smoking, you're middle aged. Okay. And I'm like, okay. I'm not going to say nothing. He goes, what, what, where'd you get out of it? At, uh, in bonds? Uh, 15 minutes before the close. <sighs> You went long. I sold short today. I said, what'd you do? Put it in the wrong order? He goes, no, I, I went short. I know. I know. I don't want to talk about it. Well, apparently you do. You fucking brought it up. <laughs> okay, I'm walking away from you. You're, you're, you're bringing it up. And everything he did in his account, he showed it to me. Everything was fading me. Does that sound like someone that is trying to do the right thing or trying to compete with their nephew? It's competition. So friends and family and coworkers are going to do what? It's going to invite that same social media arm wrestling match. I'm better than you. You're better than me. Oh, I hate you. You, know, you got more influence over more people than I do. I'm jealous of you. Fuck that. That does not make you money. And you can't fix your friends and family and coworkers. You can't. You don't know what you're doing yet. Once you're able to do it, you can say, hey, this is what I did to do this, and it's going to take a lot of work. There it is. It's easy to do it that way. They're not going to fault you because they see what you're doing now or then when you get to successful level uh, speculation. And it removes any invitation for someone to bring toxicity to what you're doing and distract you. I've already warned you up front. It's going to be painful. It's going to be boring. It's going to be work. It's not going to be easy. You're going to feel like you're second guessing yourself all the time. It feels like you're never going to get it in the beginning. And it's normal. It's all part of this. It's absolutely part of every facet of learning how to do this. Nobody tells you that in their coursework. Nobody tells you in advance. And I told everybody before they join in on mentorship, it's going to be hard. And I, it would be better for you not to fucking join. The last group, I tried to talk them out of it. Guess what? Some of them realized once they got in, wow, this is a lot more than I thought it was. Yeah. You're competing with yourself. And look how formidable you are when you want shit your way. You're just like me. They name roads after you one way. And if you're used to doing it your way, and your way is counterintuitive and counterproductive to how I'm telling you the proper way of learning how to do this is, this wrestling match is going to go on a long time. 
before you relinquish your grasp on what you think you should be doing and how you should be learning versus someone that knows how to do it and can do it and is teaching you properly and stop arm wrestling me. It's a whole lot of mental baggage that you have to contend with when you're brand new. Things that you're going to worry about that aren't really worth worrying about, but they're, they feel like they should be worried about. And the things that you should be focusing on and concerning yourself with, you're not going to want to do it because it feels like there's no benefit in that right now. And that's where people fall victim. Trading, once you know what you're doing and know what you're looking for, is easy. Finding successful, profitable setups is easy. Absolutely easy. It's next to impossible in the beginning because you're in the way. You want to be taught this way, this style. You want me to put my videos up by this time of the day. All of that is going to be a conflict internally for you. And you have to adjust and adapt just like you will have to do as a, as a speculator. The markets aren't going to deliver a setup every single day like you want it to. You might go in with a bias that's bullish and it gives you a clear reversal. You know if you try to do what you're trying to do at the beginning of the day, now it's going to result in a loss. Are you going to take the reversal? Some of you will be, nope, I'm never going to do that. And that's going to close my charts. And guess what? That's wisdom. Others are going to be more flexible and say, you know what? This is what I was expecting. It's not there. It's obviously going to go lower. I'm changing gears. I'm adapting. I'm going in there. No problem. Guess what? Does it make you a better trader? This means that you know yourself better than the next person. And others are going to say, fuck you. I'm not going to change my bias. This is the way it is. And if I get stopped out, I'm okay with that. And guess what? That's wisdom. You know yourself. You're not going to be wrecked emotionally and psychologically because you took a loss. You know that chances are you're probably going to lose, but you're going to follow this system and you're going to keep the loss at a minimum. Okay. All three of them are right. All three of them have different results. All three of them are comfortable with the results. See a difference there? Versus it has to be the best outcome all the time or it's unacceptable. That's what new traders like me, when I first started, that's what I thought was realistic and it's not. Books and teachers and gurus have a tendency, and I am guilty of this too. If you just watch a few of my videos at certain points, it sounds like it's a sugar fest. Like it's just easy to go out there and pluck the dollar bills off the tree and it's going to be a cakewalk for everybody. No. <laughs> if you listen to every one of my videos, you'll hear me talk about what I've been bloviating here. You're going to have to work your ass off and you're going to have adversities. You're going to have things challenge you. And that's good. You want that because when you go through those moments and you press through and you can still find consistency, you're never going to be fearful of going into drawdown. It isn't going to be a factor for you to want to quit. And you need that because there's going to be lots of things that's going to make you want to quit. The easiest way for you not to want to quit is don't trade with live money until you know exactly what you're doing. Because everybody quits when they start trading with an account with real money before they should. Everybody quits that. Everybody does. That's why the percentages, if you believe the statistics, that's why it's so high that 90% of them lose their account in the first 30 to 90 days. That statistical probability that is always going to shine through on a trader that has no model, no respect of risk, that goes in there and just keeps on buying, over leveraging, adding more contracts, even when they're in drawdown, that type of stuff results in that. And think about what they've learned. The books say all the same shit. Sure, they might say control your losses and you know reduce risk and have a stop loss, but they don't teach you how to wrestle with it. That's what I'm telling you in all these boring parts of these videos or in these spaces. This is the stuff that you need. You need this. You need this more than you need an entry pattern. You need this more than you need to know how to know when a fair value gap is going to stay open. You're making mountains out of anthills. And you're trying to climb Mount Everest in shorts and flip-flops with other things that are more weightier. Like you're avoiding the things that I'm telling you that this is the stuff. This is the stuff that's not in books. This is the stuff that you're going to have to wrestle with and it's going to be the catalyst for you to quit. 
How do you endure it? How do you identify as this is normal? I just got to keep doing what I'm doing. Don't do the foolish things and I will get the results I'm looking for. It won't be a straight line from start to finish to success. You're going to have this ebb and flow up and down, up and down, peaks and troughs. And every one of those things needs to be logged as an experience. What you feel, what anxieties that you feel. Not that you're beating yourself up, but you want to recognize. It's realistic for you to recognize. Admittedly, I'm feeling apprehension about going into the market because the market looks like it's indecisive right now. And I don't have a clear depiction of what I think the weekly chart is going to do. But if I have to make a decision, I would side on the market going higher. And this is why. And then at the end of the week, you go back and refer to how you felt about that instance. If you're right, you, you commend yourself. I'm glad that I was able to have the confidence to record in my journal, not take a trade. Okay. Totally different. Because what you're doing is you're fortifying your mind with positive self-talk. Even when you have a bad negative response to a, an engagement, we'll do a live session, right? And I'm expecting the market to do certain things. And maybe humanity creeps in that day and you see me get it wrong. You're going to go into your journal, if you journal at all, you're going to say, oh yeah, ICT got it wrong today. I'm second guessing all this stuff. This probably feels like a scam. Um, this isn't working today. This pattern didn't work. If there was a smart money uh, entity out there, it would have never let this fail. Uh, the algorithm is probably being changed. Everybody's watching the live stream. It's all this negative stuff you're dumping into your journal or holding it in your head is going to compound over time. And it's going to prevent any new understanding or learning in by your experiences with the concept and me, me sharing it with the live. You won't learn. You're building up walls. And it feels like you're protecting yourself from a letdown. You don't want to do that in your journal. In your journal, if you do something wrong or if we experience a, an outcome that was not favorable, like we were wanting something to pan out in the marketplace and it doesn't happen, you can go into your journal and say, okay, this is what we were expecting. I was expecting to see this happen in the market, but we observed this what I've taken away from this instance is I shouldn't be worrying about the amount of money because even though this was wrong, it would have been a measured amount of risk that it's palatable for me. So this is not a letdown. This is not a, a chasm that I can't cross. It just means this is a speed bump. And I'm excited to learn how I'm going to be able to accomplish the restitution of any drawdown that this could have created, but hasn't. And I'm thankful for that. See the difference between what I would otherwise would have been said by somebody in a tweet. And I fucked up today. I, I, I took that trade and it was a fucking loser, man. I'm never going to get this. Think about that. Some of you may not tweet that, but you're thinking it when you do stupid shit in your, in your demo or your funded account. Versus what I just said moments before that. We're recording positive self-talk. You never, you never, ever, ever beat yourself up in reflection. Never do that. That's why women look, and young men too, look at themselves in the mirror and they think they see an ugly person. They think other people see an ugly person because maybe someone said something stupid to them on social media or they are not getting recognized for what they think they should look like and they start having hate toward, hatred toward themselves. You're ugly. I need to do this. I need to lose weight. I'm going to starve myself. I'm getting a nose job. I'm getting whatever. Instead of learning how to cope with it and say, you know what? That person might not find me terribly attractive, but fuck them. I'm not sleeping with them. I don't have a relationship with them. I am going to find someone if I'm not already in a relationship with somebody, and they're going to love me for who I am because I'm providing them a wholesome partnership. And I want that. And they see past what I look like. So it's self-talk. That's something that I had to learn when I was battling high anxiety. I had debilitating anxiety. I had agoraphobia. I had a fear of being around. I couldn't, I could never have done what I'm doing with, with you right now. I don't know how many people are listening or even staying with me this long, but I, I would never be able to do what you see me do today. I would be too concerned about the opinions of other people because of who I am. You know, the way I'm, I'm, I'm I was brought, I was raised, I was brought up and I have deep scars that were childhood based not trade based, not performance based, okay, but they're childhood scars.
and I've lived my life, even at 50 years old, I can tell you honestly where I feel these things. And it's because of things that I encountered as a child, not having my parents raise me, you know, not having the, the, the affection or the encouragement of my parents. So I teach my kids hard, but they all know I love them. They all know I'm looking for them to do well. And that's when I'm talking to them in these presentations and you feel like I'm talking to you. That's why you like listening to me because you get that father figure mentality from me because I am being the father to my kids here. When I'm talking like this, I'm thinking of Caleb. I'm thinking of Cody. I'm thinking of Caden. I'm thinking of Cameron. I'm thinking about them. They're in my mind as I'm talking. Sometimes one face more than the other because of the things that they do or things that they won't do when I tell them to do it. So self-talk is really important, being positive about even a negative experience. Because every person, and I learned this from Linda Bassett, uh, if you have anxiety, if you ever had a anxiety or a panic attack, which I had many times as a young man, almost daily, multiple times, to the point where I felt like I was having a stroke or a heart attack. And I'd go to the emergency room, sometimes in an ambulance, put me on an EKG, your heart's fine, there's nothing wrong with you. In 10 minutes, as soon as they told me I was fine, heart rate normal. I'm fine. I don't feel like I'm going to pass out and I'm hungry. Let's go get something to eat and everything's back to normal. I just needed someone who I believed because they wore a white coat and I had white coat syndrome, meaning when you get around doctors, your blood pressure goes up. They're going to give you the bad news. You got a terminal illness. <laughs> it's crazy shit, but it's a real phenomenon. And until those doctors, physicians would say, you're fine, then I was fine. But before I heard them say it, I wasn't fine. High anxiety, 200 beats. Per minute, that's what my heart's tacking at. And they said, look, if you don't calm down, we have to give you something because your heart will burst. What did that tell me? You're dying of a heart attack. <clears throat> I'm even faster. And my hands are creeping up. My fingers are curling. My wrist is curling. My forearm is curling. My legs are drawing up into my midsection because I blew off all my CO2. And I'm thinking, I'm fucking dying. I'm literally rotting in my flesh right now. That's what's going in my mind. It's revving up. That's what anxiety can do to you. It's madness. It's crazy. And I learned coping skills from Linda Bassett. Attacking Anxiety is a wonderful book. Even if you don't have anxiety, it's a good read because chances are you're going to meet someone or someone that's in your circle of friends and family are going to suffer from anxiety. Or have a panic attack. And you'll recognize it because you understand from reading that book how to cope with it. And the first coping skill I learned from her is distraction. I, I would wear my watch. And the first thing is you want to look at your sweep second hand on your watch. You don't want to use a digital. Okay. I, that's why all my watches all have a sweep second hand. No matter what watch brand, I have to have a sweep second hand. Because it just gives me a sense of security, knowing that if I'm in a place, I'm out in public, and like when I was waiting for my son to have his surgery on Friday, that's why I was quiet on Twitter. That's why there was no trades taken on Twitter, on Twitter spaces and not like that. He had his surgery, probably like the 80th surgery on his throat since he was a little one. And I didn't have anxiety going in, but when they told me his surgery was supposed to have ended by 10.30, they didn't come out to get me in the waiting room. And here it is. It's 11 o'clock. And now it's 11.10. And I don't see his number updated on the screen. It says he goes from surgery to post-op recovery. So he's still under anesthesia in my mind, which they didn't update the thing. And they didn't know I didn't bring my cell phone, which is also why I didn't tweet yesterday because I didn't bring my cell phone. Otherwise, I've been tweeting like a storm, distracting myself. But then I started having a little bit of anxiety. I'm like, I hope everything's okay. But you can't go back there because of COVID bullshit that doesn't exist anymore. You can go around other people, okay? People are going around other people all the time. We're wearing masks for fuck's sake. So if my loved one is back there, let me go back there. But they don't let you do that in John Hopkins down there. They're just real, like, it's like, a, it's tight as a bull's ass in there. You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't go here. You can't go there. And I'm waiting in the lobby, waiting, waiting, waiting. So I was like, okay, I'm feeling anxious. I look at my sweep second hand on my watch, and I do exactly what I learned from Linda Bassett. You literally count the seconds. Every time that sweep second hand goes to one more second interval and it ticks around the face of the clock, you're saying the number and counting it. You cannot, it's impossible 
It's impossible to do two seconds, I'm sorry, two minutes of rotation around that. If you're counting out loud, either whisper or with your lips, looking and watching that sweet second hand, whatever scary thing or negative thought that you were thinking that you were making yourself scared and anxious about, in two minutes it goes away. You're distract you have to distract yourself from that negative thought. Every panic attack, every anxious moment, every feeling of rage starts with a moment of a thought or a response to something. So as soon as you feel that, if you're in a bad trade, okay, and you feel like you're gonna get stopped out and you're just worrying about, it, but you're not gonna fucking close the trade, look at your second hand on your watch. You should have a watch. I don't care if it's a fucking Casio, I don't give a shit. It's a sweep second hand on a watch. And you literally distract yourself from watching the chart. Look at your sweep second hand on your on your clock, on your on your wristwatch. Wherever it starts, as soon as you look at it, it's okay. Now count. One second interval. One, two, three, four. You're watching the watch. You're seeing it tick. You're anticipating it subconsciously, it ticking forward, and you're saying the, the number. There's no fucking way that you can worry about that stop loss now. You're distracted. Whatever negative thought, whatever fearful thing is causing you to be panicked. You're having an anxiety moment. Dis dismiss yourself if you're at work or if you're around other people. Dismiss yourself. Go to a bathroom. Go to a stall. Go to outside or whatever. My thing was I had to come home. Whenever I was out in public, I had a public attack of panic and, and anxiety. My safe spot was home. No matter where I was, I had to go home. When I got home and I still had panic attacks, I found out that my world was shrinking. Then I had to go to my bedroom. And I had to be in this chair, in this bedroom to feel safe. And then when I had anxiety attacks there, I'm like, where the fuck can I go now? It was debilitating. And I didn't want to be around other people because I was afraid they were going to say something that was going to trigger me. And it was all around that 9-11 bullshit. That's when I was having anxiety. It wasn't trade related. It was all terrorists and they're going to get you type shit. That's why I don't give a fuck about it now. No, I don't give a shit. They could drop bomb on my house. I don't give a fuck. Instant death, instant, instant glory. I ain't worried about it. But the way you tackle your mental baggage and fear and anxiety is you have to, number one, first distract yourself. And if you're looking at a sweep second hand on a watch for two rotations, that's two minutes, whatever negative feeling that's causing you to release adrenaline, you're a, you're a Ferrari with the, the shifter, the transmission in neutral. The Ferrari's running and you have the gas pedal all the way to the floor, but you're not in gear. That's what you're creating. You're creating a fight or flight scenario. If you're watching the market and you're having anxiety, you need to turn yourself away from the chart. Commit to the trade, but turn yourself away from the chart and look at something else. If you don't want to use a watch, you look at something in your room or far off and you describe it in detail, its shape, its color, how far away it is, how heavy it might be. And you do that for two minutes. There's no fucking way you can stay in panic. You can't. Your mind can only focus on one thing at a time. All the time, it only focuses on one thing. So if you replace the negative, fearful, inducing thoughts or negative feelings about something, you can't panic. So what's happening is, is you're turning off the pump that's putting out adrenaline. And then what happens is if you don't do this, the, the adrenaline that's being pushed into your body that you can't burn off because you're that Ferrari in neutral with the gas pedal floored and it's revving up really, really high. You're ready to go, but you're staying still, fight or flight, and you're doing nothing. You're sitting still in panic. You're in that trade, fearful that it's going to stop you out. It's fear, you're fearful that it's going to go another direction, but you already have your stop loss. You have your, your target. Commit to it. Turn yourself away from the chart. Look at something else, distract yourself just for two minutes. The adrenaline will stop. You won't release cortisol, which cortisol puts you in full fucking, I got to go to the emergency room. Like that's when you'll start feeling body sensations, tingling. You'll, your face will tingle, your arm will tingle, your hands will tingle. Okay. That's because you're not doing anything to burn off the chemicals that your body's producing. So that way you can overcome a fearful, maybe you need to fight something bigger than stronger than you. Your body was designed and created by the creator to give you that oomph, that nitrous oxide kick to make it across the finish line, hopefully alive and still keeping your ass intact. But you're doing what? You're sitting still thinking negative shit.
pumping and pumping and pumping. And all of a sudden you start feeling like you can't breathe when you can breathe. So you distract yourself, take your mind off of the negative thought and you count the second sweep hand around. The first minute around, you're just counting on the numbers. The second pass where you, where you start counting, you count times that you're breathing and you want to focus on relaxed breathing. In two minutes, every panic attack goes away. There's no panic that can exist in that, none. Because the, the cycle is you have a negative thought or a fearful thought. Boom, it starts. You got an adrenaline dump. And then all of a sudden you start worrying about that fearful thing. What if I get stopped out? What if someone says I'm a terrible trader? What if my wife comes in and feels like I've made a bad trade and she's gonna ask me where I'm at and I'm in a trade that I haven't made money in today? All these fearful things start rubbing up. More adrenaline pumps, more adrenaline pumps. And you're not doing anything, you're sitting still. You have to distract yourself and slow your breathing. Take yourself away from the negative thought. Positive self-talk is what you replace once you feel like you know that you're having a panic attack. In the beginning, you won't know that. You just feel like you're dying. You feel like you're having a heart attack. You feel like you're having a stroke. You're going to die of cancer all in five seconds. That's what it feels like. It feels like you're dying. Blackness is en encompassing you. Like it's, it's a scary feeling. But once you identify what it is and how it's starting, the distraction is positive self-talk. You tell yourself out loud, there is no emergency. And then laugh. When you laugh, you re re your body's re releasing endorphins. Endorphins are counterproductive anti-reaction to adrenaline and cortisol. Cortisol creates the body symptom. And the more that you start thinking about the body symptom, if you press into that but with fear, you'll hyperventilate and not realize it. And you're breathing faster and deeper and blowing off more of your CO2. And when you blow off your CO2, you get lightheaded. So you feel like you're having a stroke. And then all of a sudden you're feeling the tingling because you blew off all your CO2 and it feels like you're having a stroke because tingling on your arm, numbness, lightheadedness, you're having a stroke. You're having a heart attack when you're not. You just blew off your CO2. So you have to slow your breathing down, let your blood and oxygen levels regulate again. You distract yourself by reminding yourself there is no emergency and laugh about what it is you're doing. It feels weird. Try to just like, I'm doing this to myself again and there's no emergency and laugh. As soon as you laugh, your body releases endorphins and that immediately starts counteracting all the negative feelings that you're feeling from adrenaline and cortisol. Those two chemicals in your body while you're doing nothing will create body symptoms and the body symptoms, unless you replace the negative thought with positive self-talk, talking yourself down, reminding yourself there is no emergency. I'm safe where I'm at. Home is where you are, wherever you are. You're in your body. That's home. And I had to teach myself that because I felt like I was only safe in my home. I was only safe in my bedroom. I was only safe in the chair next to my computer where if I wanted to pull up something, I could find out what was going on. That's how bad you can get if you let yourself run without a leash. And in trading, you're going to find scary shit. And it's going to put you in panic-inducing situations. And it's all completely manageable. So, not sure who needed to hear that. <laughs> but it's all real, real shit. So, I've talked to you enough this morning. I've been going for a number of hours. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> We're going to close this one now. I think it's time for me to grab some fruit. I'm hungry. So I will touch base with you, by, by the way, of a video later on this evening. It'll be a short one, I promise. And we'll touch base with uh, each other on Tuesday. Tomorrow's uh, a holiday, I think. So I'm not going to be doing anything market-related there. So we'll, we'll resume on Tuesday morning. I'll touch base with you about quarter after eight, New York local time on Tuesday. Until then, enjoy your Sunday and be safe. <laughs>